I'm reaching out for arms I'm drowning in In the open-ended love with making, girl Exhale, the past Inhale, the future that lasts Change my heart, change my mind For the last time, I wanna believe in the life I've led I don't wanna leave another word unsaid You know my heart will follow you tomorrow Holding on to memories that we shared My evidence you once really cared I'm reaching for a hand to pull me up, up One open to an everlasting love Exhale the past Inhale the future that lasts Change my heart, change my mind for the last time, I wanna believe in the life I've led. I don't wanna leave another word unsaid. You know my heart will follow you in tomorrow. In tomorrow.
Hello, welcome back. Um, I hope you had a lot of typography yesterday. Any karaoke last night? Anyone? <laughs> it's a tradition. Like if you're initiating you into the club, makes sense, right? The moving typography. So of course it's karaoke. Um, hope you had fun. We're gonna have a great program for you today. We have a very great lineup. Uh, we're very excited for you to hear uh, the talk. So welcome back to day two of typographics. Um, okay, so here's the Wi-Fi for today. You might want to take a picture of it because we're, later on we're going to have an AI component which will hopefully work for you. So maybe take a picture so you can get on our Wi-Fi. We'll try to remind you if we yep. have this. And then we, of course, wanted to thank our sponsors for making this possible. So we're going to show you their wonderful work. So. Huge, huge, huge thanks to them. And now a word from our sponsors. Okay. It gives words personality, and I think it gives the people who are using the type a way to express their personality or their moods or their ideas. We can find really inspiring new shapes to use and to share with the design community. I'm addicted to that feeling, having a great shape in front of you, and it is perfect. Being able to do that for a living is just brilliant. So it's really good to see them. So again, thank you for our wonderful sponsors. It is my pleasure to open um, the conference for day two with our first uh, speaker. Um, and our first speaker today is Eddie Opara, and he just told me that it's his second time on the stage. So the first time was a little while ago, but uh, it's really good to have him back here. So Eddie Opara is a partner at Pentagram, a senior critic at Yale University School of Art, uh, where he received his MFA back in 1997. 
ADE's projects have included brand identities, publications, packaging, environments, exhibitions, interactive installations, websites, user interfaces, and software. Exploring the theme of regenerative narratives, plural and singular, Eddie will show us how type design facilitates communication and serves a grander narrative. At its best, typography is imbued with historical undertones, cultural symbolism, and artistic beauty. And we have a small request. Eddie is going to show you something very special that's not public yet. Uh, so we ask you to refrain from, from taking photos or recordings, but sit back and enjoy a wonderful sneak peek at something that is not public yet. So you're in for a treat. Thank you so much, Eddie. Good morning. Thank you, Sasha. And hello. I'm, a, I'm always amazed when uh, people can get up in the morning um, on a Saturday to listen to me. Let's put it that way. Um, I, I work in many different areas within visual communications and many different things and many different areas. But I always sometimes come back to the aspects of type, um, focusing on um, and working with Chester, Chester Jenkins on the Cooper Hewitt, and also Oppo, which was actually a delight that's now being updated by SDL in, in, in Sweden, and also uh, enhancing Calibri for Lululemon, and also working on a custom type system for Samsung um, Galaxy phones. But and I may no note, um, and then Sasha also noted that unfortunately I can't, um, um, you know, show everything um, that I want today uh, in regards to my um, presentation. Um, but uh, in 2024, very early, it will be released. Um, you know, as I stated, my talk is about regenerative narratives, and what is that? That's really dealing with the intentional crafting of type design that fulfills not only you know, a, you know, a purpose of facilitating communication, but also to assimilate a grander narrative with imbuing historical undertones, societal and also um, cultural symbolism, and uh, has an unparalleled artistic beauty towards it, and really encompasses a progressive and forward-thinking discourse for everyone. And, uh, you know, this approach is really trying to lead a deeper and more dynamic interconnection between form and content uh, within a particular brand um, to convey a better message. And so, as uh, Sasha said, the project has not been launched, but I'm going to start off with this gentleman here. He, he's not, uh, it's not for him, but he is, uh, he is uh, the Omaha Oracle, uh, Warren Buffett, and it is about Omaha. Um, you know, it's quite amazing that Omaha has um, the most amount of millionaires per capita in this nation, thus the world. Nobody knows that, right? That's nuts. Um, but it's also the gateway to the West, right? Uh, their motto is, we don't, uh, we don't coast, as it were. Um, which is kind of interesting. But that sort of red triangle indicates the purpose that uh, I'm sort of talking about today is the Jossing Art Museum. Um, and it's a beautiful, beautiful place. Um, it's Nebraska's largest art museum, first opened its doors in 1931. Um, and uh, it was designed uh, by a father and son architectural team named John and Alan MacDonald. Um, and, you know, this is what you're seeing right now is the uh, iconic Jocelyn Memorial Building that is part of the museum itself. But I also want to sort of say, you know, thanks um, to my, a part of my team that actually worked on this. This is Ken Deegan, Bella, um, Pedro, uh, Jim Park, uh, Sandra Marcel dealing with strategy, and Ruben. Um, and the fact of the matter, the reason why I uh, brought them up is because they are um, 
exceedingly important within the aspects of the design for this uh, project, especially for the type. And one of the things that we had to do, we had to achieve, is really talk, uh, you know, for a brand, we really talk to a lot of people. And we, we talked to 31 key stakeholders within uh, the Jocelyn organization, over uh, 1,300 uh, survey respondents and 20 hours of conversation were, were dealt with. And so this is all over sort of uh, the aspects of Omaha and Nebraska, which is really, really important for us. And what did we find? Well, we, we wanted to sort of break down um, a lot of these particular elements uh, in a sort of clearer picture for you because there was a lot. But we found that the Jocelyn is respected and edgy, and that means that, you know, we need to sort of push the boundaries to achieve a bold change, you know, a sense of absolute change, but also with taste, maturity, and admiration for the institution itself, right? And, uh, and design excellence is at the forefront of that. The idea here is that uh, the Jocelyn is dynamic but not quiet is always really interesting, you know. Um, it's kind of an oxymoron, but to a certain or contradiction, to a certain degree, that art isn't boring at all, and neither should the, the Jocelyn. You know, there's, they've been too quiet for too long um, in the um, uh, Omaha, Nebraska, and the Midwest area for such an institution, and the brand really needs to spark a sense of creativity sense of ideas and actions, you know, and, and that is uh, important even if you have this sort of underlying energy. And the Jocelyn, you know, needed to be illuminating, not heavy. And, uh, you know, with great art and architecture, it, it makes you think, right? And so the brand should really feel insightful in an uplifting way. Um, the Jocelyn sort of really needs to illuminate uh, that rather than it being intimidating. And we have to look at that from the inclusive point of view. A uh, majority of, um, uh, of their audience is white, and thus that needs to, that needs to change. Um, there's, there needs to be the sense of freshness that rather than the formal, the, the light rather than the dark. And so we try to, try to amalgamate all this up into sort of these key pillars, respected, dynamic, illuminating, um, to determine this um, North Star, this brand I idea, which is re regenerations, right? And regenerations is about perpetual becoming and the sense of change. It's fresh, as I said before, and it speaks to unending renewal, the evolution through generations for generations, right? Every new year requires them to let go of what it, it, they are and what they can be right, to what they can be, to wonder, to imagine, to reimagine. And there's this continual opportunity to spark new ideas at the Jocelyn, where the greats and of the past inspire people of today and tomorrow. And so with that, we go into our aspects of, of uh, observation for a, a visual change. And we observed um, the sense of history and architecture and images that we collected at uh, the Jocelyn uh, Museum on our, our, on our multiple visits that were really vital to our process. And, you know, here is a, a photograph of uh, Sari H. Jocelyn, who um, created the, uh, um, the museum itself in memory of her husband, the businessman George A. Jocelyn. And uh, as I said, it was opened in 1931. And um, it's, it's quite amazing when you sort of walk up to those, uh, those, those, those steps where you, uh, you see Hartley Burr Alexander, uh, an expert in uh, Native American anthropology, sort of ins inscri inscriptions on the building that these inscriptions were created uh, and generated by uh, John David uh, uh, Brishin, a, a Serbian-American um, um, Chicago-based sculptor, and absolutely phenomenal pieces. And what we were trying to do is we needed to understand what the, the key challenges actually were. Snoheta comes into play. The Norwegian firm, um, architectural firm, 
um, that uh, were commissioned to design the 42,000 square foot addition to the museum. And in addition to the, the new gallery spaces, the architectural team um, included uh, a local team called APMA that designed more than three acres of rejuvenated uh, public uh, gardens and uh, outdoor spaces um, to re really restore and interconnect um, to the Jocelyn Museum and also its annexed, uh, the Scott Pavilion that I'll talk about uh, in a few moments. And it's, it's a really beautiful uh, piece of architecture. It, it sort of allows the Jocelyn to gain back its sort of premier cultural hub for visual arts um, by reorientating the mu museum grounds and, and focusing on the interior structures. And one of the things that sort of stood out for me in regards to this particular project was uh, something that Snohata did, um, uh, actually created it, um, this tripartite. And um, if anybody knows, doesn't know what a tripartite is, it's really anything that consists of three parts. Um, and it's, it becomes a key indicator of how the building not only coalesces, but relays how regenerations work in the physical form. And so how can typography do something similar? How can it sort of create a unification of sorts um, within these particular buildings, the Jocelyn Building, the Scott Pavilion, created by Norman Foster and Associates, and the Hawks Pavilion, which is created by Snohetta. And as you can see, these are the three um, buildings um, all at once. Different periods of time, 1931, 1991, uh, 2024. Well, we started sketching, um, and to basically really think about it from the imbued historical undertones and societal uh, aspects, we really needed to sort of dig deeper and to create a, a more interconnected um, dynamic uh, element within the form of the content. And we start off with the Jocelyn, uh, the memorial building, and we started looking at the aspects of um, the angular tones, as well as the, the inscriptions on the building, as well as what we've heard from the, uh, the key stakeholders and also um, uh, Nebraskans as well. And these angular forms really are exceedingly important in the interior. Um, it's a really interesting, also quite wacky place. And so we started to sort of consider those elements of the, the, uh, these angular crossbars and strokes and cuts, and they were super intriguing to us how we can actually sort of progress with these sort of uh, elements. Um, and the way that the irregularity of, of the, the, the inscriptions are actually cut, uh, the slight flares that uh, are produced. And so we started to put these elements together. The idea of the angular uh, forms, the sharp corners, the slight flares, to produce a more contemporary element in regards to the, the type that we were considering. And with the Scott Pavilion, the Foster, you know, it's really rectilinear. It's just rectilinear. Um, and, and so how can one actually deal with rectilinear elements? And so providing and adding it to that core uh, item that uh, uh, Prashin actually created, we start to create an entirely different type form. Um, and, uh, and with the Hawks Pavilion, the idea of echo, the inside and outside with this sort of sense of curvature was really important, but also applying that rectilinearity was also important. So providing those two, two things together in a very contemporary manner was important. And I think you're fully getting, you know, getting closer to what I'm, 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 I'm you know, focusing on. The idea is that we developed a, uh, a type system, all cap based, that is, not just three, but also five typefaces that work as one, um, from the historical, the midpoint, to the contemporary. And how that family um, works together is an important factor um, towards the success of the Jocelyn. I can't really show, I cannot show you the uh, identity itself, but I'll show you the typefaces that we built. And to a certain degree, they are you could say partly bizarre, um, but in a wonderful way, uh, in a contemporary way, with an historic um, underpinning towards them and a transition from one to the other. And yes, through the buildings, each particular typeface will be indicated. So 
you cannot, you can't, you can and cannot utilize the typefaces between the buildings. It's interesting. You go into the Hawks, you get the Hawks. When you go into the Scott, you'll get the Scott. When you go into the Jocelyn, you get the Jocelyn. But they all work together. And the factor of the matter is that um, we really needed to consider um, another part of this, uh, the, the sense of publications and, um, and also online elements. Um, we look at the classifications of, the, of certain genres uh, of the Jocelyn um, from the ancient uh, all the way to the contemporary, and we sort of generated two extra typefaces to actually uh, complement the three that uh, went together. And so how would we use it from the historical to the midpoints to the contemporary? So we're considering it from the you know, 20 BC to 17th century, the 18th century to the 20th century, and the, the 20th century beyond. And the, the considerations are utilizing this very sharp and aggressive serif to this flared typeface to the contemporary typeface that we had shown you earlier, a mixture of the two systems uh, of the three systems that I had relayed to you earlier. And so this is the serifs um, elements in regards to the numerals, the diacritics, and this is the flares and numerals as well. But the fascinating thing is that we're not so much type designers, we're graphic designers, and we established uh, and, and built this because of the time that we had. And I, I sort of would love more type, uh, uh, type design to be integrated within graphic designers' um, lifestyle more and more, generating them more and more for brand worthiness. The idea of inclusion is exceedingly important. The Omaha Ponca um, that only makes up, I think, registered uh, just under 6,000 of them uh, within the um, Omaha area is the Native American tribe. And they um, have their own glyph system. But we wanted to integrate that into the um, typefaces. Reason being, um, the, the, the museum holds one of the largest um, um, collections of um, Na uh, Native American uh, artworks in the country and um, also really being influenced by that is, was exceedingly important. And so developing these particular glyphs were important. The idea that you're probably not seeing an upper lower case system or a workhorse typeface is that our, we utilized um, ABC Dynamo's Arizona and integrated the Omaha Ponca glyph system in there. So I'm just gonna show you a few images uh, of type tests that we were dealing with and, uh, and all the, the types of characteristics that we can actually provide. But the idea of infusing aspects of beauty within, um, in, within the aspects of the, the brand narrative was really important and the rationale of what the client wanted and what the community wanted, of what the buildings give us, provides us with something um, special and, um, and um, historic and also progressive at the same time. And the factor of the matter is that um, we're really very excited to um, continue working with them um, on this particular journey. We are nearly there. We have a few months left. The building is being built at this moment in time and will open in 2024, um, hopefully with signage like this and this. So. Thank you. Should I come up okay. Thank you, Eddie. And something for you all to look forward to when the project is public. Thank you so much, Eddie. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our next presenter, Gabriella Nami. Uh, is here with us. It's wonderful to have her back at Cooper Union. Uh, she's a Brazilian designer who co-founded Estudio Barca uh, in Sao Paulo uh, and worked as a senior designer at Sagmeister and Walsh. Uh, she's currently working at Google as art director of YouTube Music. Uh, in her talk, Gabriela will share her experience as a music and tech outsider uh, by walking us through some of her projects and showing us how type design shapes her design work. Enjoy. Uh, 
thank you, everyone at Typographics. Uh, my name is Gabriela Nami, and I'm a designer and art director from Brazil, based in New York City. Um, as Sasha said, I currently work at Google as YouTube Music's art director, uh, but I wanted to give you a quick timeline on my design path. I studied graphic design in Brazil, and before graduating, I was already grinding the agency life. I didn't have a lot of time balancing school and a full-time job with agency hours, but I was excited to do it. And very quickly, I learned that the brand designers that I admired the most either did type or had deep knowledge on the subject. So I switched jobs and I started working as an editorial designer at a trend research company. Uh, I had better hours, but mostly they gave me a month vacation. And you know what you do when you have a month vacation. Uh, you sign up for Type at Cooper, the condensed version. Um, <laughs> I'm not a nerd at all. Um, anyway, I was super excited, and I will get back to it. But uh, after that, I went freelancing. Eventually, uh, that led to opening my own studio with my friend June. He's still killing it with the studio. But eventually, I was called to move to New York and work at Sagmaster Walsh. And after three years working there, uh, I moved to Google. So nice to meet you. This is a brief summary. Uh, and now back to type design. I decided to design a pretty boring typeface, uh, and by boring I mean this is not a display font, this is a workhorse font uh, meant to be used for long text. And I wanted to learn the basics and learn all the rules, so hopefully I would be able to break the rules in the future. I named it Kafka because it was my favorite author at the time, uh, but it was also such a metamorphosis to work from of this font, and like I had never done calligraphy before, I never did robo font. And my sketches, my calligraphy sketches look like cockroaches. So it was really amazing to see this transform into a phone at the end. And my mom was really proud too. Uh, she had, this was 10 years ago. She still hangs my specs on her walls and I don't even have the files anymore. Um, but guess who wasn't proud? Ice-T. <laughs> Ice-T is not impressed with my efforts and he's not impressed with any of your efforts. And I kind of get it because being a designer is like speaking a foreign language that no one is able to really speak it, but everyone can kind of understand it. But the one part of graphic design that like most people really cannot speak is type. We don't really have in Brazil or in the United States and many other countries great design programs inside college. Uh, so in my opinion, we don't really learn history, calligraphy, and other tools enough to really understand type. And honestly, like, it's really hard work. Like, this is actually one of the photos I found from 2013. Um, a gray phone is not something that you can just, like, press generate and suddenly it's there. Uh, it takes a lot of effort and time. So I decided it wasn't for me. Uh, I don't want to be a type designer. But the knowledge that I learned at Cooper was really incredible and valuable for me. And I think that made my work as a graphic designer better. I think it, I really benefited from it because, because I understood the structure of the fonts. I was not only able to pick and spot the best fonts, but also make better decisions on my projects. And the first project I want to show you is Zuba, um, which is a Cairo-based restaurant that opened in New York City. Uh, not far from here, you should definitely go because their falafel sandwich is really good. Um, but it's an identity I work at in Walsh under Jessica Walsh's creative direction, and it always started drawing an A. Um, so Zuba already existed in Cairo, but they wanted to change their identity and mix with New York vibes. Uh, so I started playing with Arabic calligraphy and that New York super extended sans serif type, um, which eventually led to this A, and it made me really proud. So I just took the concept and the thinking around that A and apply to all the other Zuba letters. And thank goodness it's a short word. Uh, also, maybe this was going to be a whole alphabet. I wasn't sure yet. So it's a monospace phone by design, not only because I knew it would be relatively faster to make it monospace, but also because I wanted to design those building graphic blocks that was going to be easy for the client to mix and match in the future and pair it with the font. So we provided a bunch of frames and graphic elements that could be easily combined as graphic building blocks for the future. Also, I designed so many iterations of this uh, facade, 
And usually you expect that maybe the client will pick the worst ones. And I'm glad that he picked, in my opinion, the best one. Uh, but also, this is a super different client. Uh, when it comes to this facade, the briefing was like, just make it art. Uh, and it's so good to have a client like that. So I worked on the Zuba letters and maybe a set of other five letters. And then I worked with Kyung Ki Hong to expand the whole alphabet. And he did such a great job adding his own point of view. The why is so inventive. And we brought elements from the Cairo restaurant, but also with a new identity. So this is their classic Cairo wrapping paper, exactly how it is in Cairo, but with a new font and new aesthetic. This is uh, an image where the whole design exploration for the final identity came from. I was working on those boxes and really seeing how those frames would make it very easy for the client to use in the future. And the client brought this calligraphic, the, uh, the calligraphic Zuba that was made in Cairo by a real food car painter. Uh, the client only mentioned, please, it's a Cairo restaurant, don't bring hieroglyphs. So I did, <laughs> but in an ironic way, because I think what he was trying to say is like, this is a very lazy solution and kind of stereotypical. But we, we did it in a way that like we're remixing funny Cairo and New York City situations like the J train and New York cabs and the classic Cairo food baskets. Uh, this is Carlos. He's actually sitting right here. Uh, he served as my model. Uh, but here you can see how the graphic building blocks and frames are really easy to use. And we work with Zach Tabal for illustrations on very Cairo-specific situations. I love this one with the cat. Um, so working at Sagmaster and Watch was a really valuable experience for me. And after three years, I was craving more learning, and I was invited to work on a new product called YouTube Music. And this is tech, and I come from a lot of different environments, um, but mostly agency, like branding agencies, trend research agency, owning agencies, uh, having my studio. This is all agency life. Uh, tech is very different, um, but it's music, and who doesn't love music? And obviously, music is a very pivotal force in our culture. Um, it triggers a lot of emotions. And it's a known fact that the music that you listen to as a teenager really hits you differently than other music that you listen to as an adult. So it was only natural for me to think about the music I was listening in as a teenager. Um, and it, I kind of built my identity around it at the time, like from political perspectives to favorite writers and hobbies. As a teenager, I really think that I read those visuals and how those people looked and those bands, and I was drawn to that I was, uh, I wanted to be like them, and I knew that at some level those bands and music encompass all of the ideas that the music stood for. So that's when I realized that visuals tell a lot, and each element of those designs represent an aspect of punk intentionally or unintentionally. So when I joined you to music, what I encountered was a template that didn't convey all those ideas that and emotions that music does, and we needed a redesign. Uh, not only to convey those emotions, but also because those playlists were being rebranded to more specific names instead of genre plus hot list. So for this tier of the playlist that we call flagships, I decided it was important to, one, show the full photo, the full art direction. It's important to show the contents of those photos, where those artists are, whether it's a favela in the case of funk hot list, or a flat paper background with studio lighting that says a lot about the genre. And it matters a lot to just show the full artist and photography vision, um, but also because those photos and the playlists are updated weekly and they're released to, as they, they are tied to a specific music release. So this Bad Bunny photo is tied to a 2020 release. A 2020 Q release would be a different photo. So because we were changing the name of the playlist to really speak to the genre and the community around it, there comes my case to more specific fonts or letterings that carry the emotions around it. And ultimately, not all cultures and genres can fit inside a template and they shouldn't. So from my first project, the hit list, a multi-genre United States flagship, or Conducted, that's all about classical music, or Al Million, that's our Latin US-based playlist, or Conditions in the Ground, that's only about independent artists, um, I really try to put type in the front of all of it. But I want to go deeper on this one. Wait, it's, the name is Jardim, which in Portuguese it translates to garden. And it's about 
Brazilian popular music, MPB. MPB has a very interesting history. It traces back to the 60s as a genre born during the dictatorship, highly associated with resistance. So all its fans and artists uh, were mostly composed by students that were against the 1964 coup. And it happened just after the Bossa Nova boom. So when you think of Bossa Nova, think about like a fancy cocktail party and everyone is just really fancy and chill and calm. And then PB is way edgier, so it's bringing innovation not only to the genre itself, like playing with electric guitars and bringing Tropicalia to the table, but also it really triggered a political change in the country. So artists like Elis Regina, Chico Buarque, Gal Costa, Gilberto Gil, set the tone for what we think about traditional MPB, like 70s, 80s classics. And good ideas usually come with good design and vice versa, so it's no surprise that the covers of the time go absolutely hard, and they still do. MPB keeps changing over the years. It's not limiting to a specific technical or music criteria. It was always influenced and let it influence by global genres like hip hop, pop, uh, but it also embraced new local genres like Brazilian funk and new country. And all of this beauty is really hard to fit inside a square, tiny, tiny thumbnail. So I look at the OG thumbnails, which are the tiles, and Atos Bulcão uh, is a, an amazing tile artist, uh, painter and sculptor, whose work is all over Brazil. But uh, also because the name of the playlist is Jardim, it's translated to garden. I looked at the, uh, the work of Burle Marx, who's a Brazilian landscape architect, and basically tried my best to translate all of this crazy, beautiful history and artists into this playlist. And each art is amazing, but specifically for MPB and the political and artistic evolution it brought, uh, I think there's a collective aspect to it that cannot be denied. So instead of adding a bunch of flowers in one single tile, I decided it would be better to have one flower per playlist and together they form a garden. Um, and MPB keeps growing together with recurrent artists and new artists. It's a hybrid garden since its beginnings and it keeps flourishing new ideas of Brazil. Um, but I have those notes in my phone, uh, and this is from 2021. Me and my friends, including Carlos, we were talking about if Paul Rand woke up in 2021, how would you explain to him what it is to be a designer in tech? And we had a lot of fun thinking about it. Uh, but when it comes to design aspects, that are, like specific design and visual aspects of it, I don't think it's much difference. Uh, I don't really see myself as a product or a graphic designer. I'm a designer. And I can see we need less elements in a small surface, like a thumbnail. So this is a very tiny improvement that I wanted to show you, um, like a small tweak when it comes to the size of the artist image. Uh, another project I want to show you is APAM, which stands for Asian Pacific Heritage Month. Um, and I started this project by thinking of what it means to be Asian. What is the term Asian American? Um, this is a pan-ethnic term coined by Chinese and Japanese students in the University of California, Berkeley. Um, and they were very much looking at other movements at the time, like the Black movement or the Chicano movement, and kind of finding a space for themselves and other people that looked like them. So it's a very broad term. And like most broad terms, they put a broad bucket of people inside the same category. And as a third generation Japanese in Brazil, I can see similarities with my other Asian friends here uh, in North America, uh, but also as you can see a lot of differences. And I do see gay Caspian Kang's uh, point of this term being a demographic descriptor that satisfies not a lot of people, but mostly professionals who enter mostly white middle-class spaces and need a term to describe themselves. And I love this part. Um, I know many people who emigrated from Asia. I know almost no one invested in the idea of Asian America. So we could chat about this forever, but I, I guess what I got from it is there's no really a right way to do this project. There's not really a specific visual cue that I could rely on. So I decided to rely on very a bold attitude because I think a lot of Asians grew up with this idea that Asians are timid or shy and the idea of nostalgia. So I look at stamps from any stamps, vintage stamps from Asia. And this is how other playlists look. And it worked well because this was the first time that YouTube Music brought my designs outside of the screen and feature 
uh, in and out of home. This is in Times Square. I didn't even love this design as it is, but it was such an amazing moment to see it in such a large platform. And I had a lot of failed designs for this. Like I had a lot of ugly stereotypical things that I did. I was like, this just doesn't feel right. Um, maybe I won't be able to do this project. I never showed them to anyone because they were so bad. And I was really trying to do something different than before. Uh, so I often go back to this note by Milton Glazer that says that prof professionalism and doing things right all the time is just one very boring, but also a limited goal. And I do think I feel fuller creatively when I seek for continuous transgression. But another note I have is, what am I exchanging my workforce for? And it's not only money. I won't go deep on this one, but basically, I could just keep designing those APM playlists. And, but ultimately, this is not what the Heritage Month is about. And I wanted to see this identity matter from other perspectives. And I also love to collab with amazing people. So I invited Dengue Choi to illustrate the 2022 covers. And she did such an amazing job. Her you know, in tech, we're in a very vector-oriented corporate Memphis kind of universe, and having her brush strokes there just felt like so refreshing and beautiful. So we received, like, we, we use this uh, asset for everything, like out of home, playlists, uh, in-app at YouTube, received some Asian influencers from YouTube Shores for a panel. We saw Pillow perform. That was really awesome. And for 2023, I invited Koi Bifam to illustrate our covers. Um, he had this amazing idea to reference Ocean Vong's book, On Earth, We're Briefly Gorgeous. In the book, she uses butterflies as a symbol of migration. And I love how he worked with this metallic bow treatment that contrasts with the idea of a delicate butterfly. And I decided to pair with the, a phone called Disc because it really reminded me of Savage's phones. And that was a very important decade for the Asian American movement. And naturally, there's like a strong Y2K element to this identity. So uh, we brought some Y2K phones for the stickers. And I want to finish it with Q2022 Recap, which is one of our biggest projects at YouTube. Recap is a look back on your music listening habits. So uh, this will tell you your favorite artists, your favorite tracks. And last year, we had this feature that it will also tell you what's your music profile. Uh, what's your music identity? And it always started when the team was talking about psychological tests, Horsha tests. And, and I, I thought about Horsha tests and this idea of like abstract versus figurative. The first person who came to mind was the illustrator Benedict Luft uh, because he does that beautifully. It's like a beautiful balance between figurative and abstract. And his style is so ownable, but also so likable. For a broad audience like YouTube, this was perfect. And I designed the identity with his illustrations on my mock. So if he said no to the project, I would just have to quit. But he said yes. <laughs> and this was super fun. The illustrations were absolutely beautiful. It translated really well to other languages. Uh, here's the best uh, feature, I think, like Google Photo integration. So it allowed to, you to see your photos and pair with your favorite tracks of the season. And we translated all of this to out of home in Nashville, Atlanta, New York, LA, Berlin, and in the UK as well. Here's uh, New York and LA. And it was super cool to have this on Times Square too. It was such a win for the team. Everyone was so excited uh, to see it live, even though like we we're working in product so much. So. I'm really proud of Kitan to Q recap, and I cannot wait to show you what we come up to uh, this year. And this note is from Kitan 2019 Q, but I still get back to this frequently. I mentioned before how I still doesn't care about type, and I love that tweet. Uh, when moving countries or going to tech after a long time in agency life or designing for a complete new project, I often feel like the outsider, but not in a bad way. Uh, I think the outsider often has insights that are not natural in a certain environment. And while I'm bringing them to the table, I'm also learning a lot from that environment. 
Um, and it's a hard job to translate to a client or a team or to ST that some things matter. Uh, but it's fun and I'm enjoying it and I hope you're still enjoying it today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Colin. Um, before we get to um, the first half of the third quarter of typographics, we're going to have one more talk. Um, our next presenter is, um, uh, let's see, there we go, uh, Ben Grandjeanette. Uh, so we looked at some uh, museum identity work, we just looked at some digital design work, and now we're going to go into the world of print. Uh, ben Grandjeanette is a graphic designer based in Brooklyn, but Ben grew up in Wahoo, Nebraska, so we have a wonderful unplanned link to Nebraska. Uh, and I was curious what Wahoo, Wahoo is a species of shrub in the bittersweet family. Also an awesome name for a city. Uh, ben graduated from the School of Visual Arts in 2013. Uh, as a design director of New York Times Magazine for 10 years, he has designed over 500 issues of the magazine. That's a lot. Um, in this talk, Ben will show us how he develops typographic identities for special issues of the magazine, and will show us how he tries, week after week, to make something new for a 126-year-old weekly publication. Please enjoy Ben's talk. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I really happy to be here and uh, share my work with you all. Uh, just start by a little bit about myself, and I admit I did not think I would be the second person to talk about Nebraska here today. Um, uh, I grew up in a small town, uh, Wahoo, Nebraska. Um, this is me and my, it's a town of about 4,000 people, actually like 30 minutes outside of Omaha, so been to the Jocelyn Art Museum uh, many times. Uh, this is me and my twin sister, Abby. Uh, I'm at our grandparents' farm. Uh, I'm the older of us by one minute. It's a fact I make sure to remind her of as much as I can. Um, after graduating high school, I enrolled at the School of Visual Arts to study graphic design. Uh, it was there that at SBA that I studied under Karen Goldberg, who unfortunately passed away earlier this year. Um, many of you here may be familiar with her work, or maybe were a student or a friend of hers. Uh, Karen believed that if you knew uh, how to design great typography, you could design anything. And uh, she had a tremendous influence on me in, as a designer, so I'd just like to take this moment to say thank you, Karen. I got my start at the New York Times Magazine as an intern in the fall of my senior year at SVA in 2012. Um, I was hired on as a junior designer uh, and started there a week after graduation. Uh, and that's where I've been working for the last 10 years. It's been a very linear path, and this grid here represents every issue of the magazine that's been published since I started in um, full time. It's, as of today, 521 issues. Uh, for anyone not familiar, the New York Times Magazine is a weekly general interest publication. Uh, it was first published in 1896, and it covers a huge range of topics from week to week, uh, from political coverage to cultural commentary to reporting from the front lines of global conflict. Uh, and as you can imagine, it's, it's a fast-paced environment and highly collaborative environment as well. I would be remiss not to show some fonts to you all at a typographics conference. Um, these are the brand typefaces we use each week at the, at the magazine. They were designed for our 2015 rebrand by Henrik Kubel from A2 Type. Um, and they really, each week we publish three to four long form features and that's really the place where these fonts um, are often represented in the most expressive ways. Uh, for each opener, it's really a way to bring the reader into the story, trying to create an entry point that communicates something from the text itself and having different tones. And that's really what I started out designing for the most part, learning as much as I could about design and trying different things each week. Here's an example, here's just a selection of stuff that I've done over the years.
And it's also been a place where I've been able to develop uh, custom typography for stories. And that's been something that I really enjoyed uh, being able to do from week to week as well. And this is just to emphasize the fact that none of these projects get made by one person. The magazine often runs like a well-oiled machine, but it takes this big group of incredibly talented and passionate people to get the issues out the door every week. This is our current staff, not including our staff writers and visual contributors. Um, we're led by our fantastic editor-in-chief, Jake Silverstein, and our creative di director, Gail Bickler. 10 to 15 times a year, the magazine runs a special uh, themed issues dedicated to a single topic. It's an opportunity for us to create a cohesive look and feel uh, for the design and the art direction. Each special issue essentially functions as like a mini identity project. For the 314th issue that I worked on, uh, the magazine was set to run our fourth annual New York issue, which each year it documents New York from a different editorial lens. Oftentimes the initial conversations for these kinds of issues happen in a conference room where editors and visual team members meet to discuss the editorial direction. For this issue, I had been thinking about this idea that at any given time, any number of performances could be happening in New York City. And that was something that through just this brainstorming discussion, our editors had really been drawn to and liked this idea, and we decided to continue with the theme, um, ultimately landing on the direction of a day in the life of a performer in New York City. In thinking about how to package together this different content, um, one of the things I really enjoy is the visual research aspect of it. And for this issue, I was really inspired by the the beauty of the marquee typography and the musicality that you can see in the details of it, as well as the energy and expressiveness of event posters and flyers. I also wanted it to all tie back to New York in some way and was inspired by the subway signage from the that existed before the Massimo Vignelli redesign. As it happened, uh, a few years earlier, I made this display font based on that signage, um, and we decided to use it throughout the issue. In, in starting the approach to the cover, I was really excited about this idea of packaging it together to feel like a promotional poster. And so this is a little bit of the process of making it. I first pitched it as a sort of pseudo table of contents that could promote each performer from the issue. And, that didn't really work. It was lacking the immediacy of introducing the idea as a whole. It wasn't until we worked with our editors closely and tailored the display language to pick up on the way that event poster spoke that this started to come together. And this is the final cover. A star has made 12 performers from an opera singer to a subway dancer show what it takes to light up the stage in New York City. We printed the cover with a fluorescent Pantone yellow and paired the black type, uh, paired it with black type, which became the two main colors that uh, existed throughout the issue. And as a nod to the iconic New York City taxis, the poster language continued throughout the issue. Um, this here is the table of contents. This is the opener for a story following the day in the life of a New York City prima ballerina. On the inside, our photo team had commissioned the photographer, Brenda Ann Keneally, to follow each performer throughout their day, documenting their life. We also featured an opera singer, sword swallower, a rapper, and of course, we can't forget Showtime. Issue 322. Um, this issue has become, I would say, the most ambitious and the biggest project that the magazine has done yet. 
In January 2019, our staff writer, Nicole Hannah-Jones, uh, pitched the idea of creating a special issue uh, commemorating the date of 1619. It marked the 400th anniversary of the first enslaved Africans arriving to the, to the shores of what would become the United States. The idea of the issue would be to illustrate through a series of stories the lasting impact of slavery on contemporary life across the US. And Nicole posited that no event is more important to the founding of our country than the arrival of these first enslaved Africans. As part of the initial work that we did, a team of our editorial design and photo departments visited the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, DC. We met there with the curators and walked through the museum, experiencing firsthand the objects and artifacts and careful curation of the space. And it was an incredibly inspiring and emotional experience. And if any of you haven't been there, I encourage you absolutely to go. Um, we all came away from this trip incredibly motivated to tell this story as best as we could. The trip also provided a starting point for some of the thinking on the typographic language of the issue. I was very interested in finding a way to connect this sense of history to the present through the design. I wanted the design to acknowledge the past, but not to make the issue feel pastiche and ultimately to communicate a sense of urgency. From the beginning pages, we wanted to instill 1619 as an important date, knowing that most Americans wouldn't be familiar with this date and that this aspect had been overlooked and undereducated. These pages represent a sampling of the various contributors to the project, including journalists, historians, a poet, a culture critic, as well as our visual contributors. We wanted to give a sense of the expertise brought to this issue. And the, and the choices about the contributors were very intentional. The majority of the voices throughout the issue are black, and that has continued as the project has grown. For the display language throughout the issue, I presented the idea that each story would begin with a typography that makes the main argument of each article, connecting the past history to the present context, so that even if a reader skimmed the headlines, they would come away with an understanding of what the project was about. This first essay is by Nicole Hannah-Jones on, on the fight by black Americans to make the founding ideals of this country true. We also had an essay on slavery's connection to traffic planning in Atlanta, on black music's influence on all genres of American music. on how the way black people are treated at the doctor's office today is still connected to the racist framework from the time of slavery. And on how the building blocks of US capitalism were created by people who were enslavers. Additionally, throughout the issue, 17 original literary works were created, uh, responding to important dates throughout US history. And for the cover, we sent photographer Daniel Bowman to the location where we can best estimate that the first ship came to the shores of what would become Virginia, viscerally bringing our readers to the historic moment of arrival. The magazine issue was simultaneously published online through a special broadsheet section which told the history of US slavery that you didn't learn in school, as well as a podcast series uh, by Nicole Hannah-Jones. Additionally, 250,000 additional copies were distributed to schools and libraries, and a curriculum was developed in partnership with the Pulitzer Center uh, so that the project could be taught in high schools and colleges. And while we knew the importance of this issue, I don't think that any of us could have uh, anticipated how far reaching its reception would be. Uh, the project has become a lightning rod for conversation on race and identity politics in the United States, and has it's been discussed uh, heavily through social media, at presidential debates, even being explicitly banned in various states throughout the country. And it prompted President Trump in, to create a 1776 commission, to which he said this, and uh, raise yourselves. Critical race theory, the 1619 project, and the crusade against American history is toxic. 
propaganda, ideological poison that if not removed will dissolve the civic bonds that tie us together, will destroy our country. Um, but as much as there's been critical discourse, it's also been met with incredible enthusiasm. Um, the magazine sold out of newsstands across the country, and while the project was available and incredibly beautifully presented online, people went out of their way to get their hands on this print artifact. This video here is of a crowd lined up outside the Times building uh, after our editor-in-chief tweeted about free copies being given out. The issues continue to live on in various ways through events held throughout the country, books that were published, as well as a recent documentary series on Hulu. <clears throat> and it continues on with forthcoming books. Uh, for the last seven years, the magazine's run a special issue uh, dedicated to a selection of songs that chosen by our editors and writers representing the current state of music. This issue is uniquely suited to presentation online where we can provide readers with a preview of the song while they scroll. Starting out, the concept of the typograph typographic approach uh, for this year centered around the idea of sound waves and musicality. Be because of the multimedia and multi-platform approach, uh, to this issue, I began the process with the digital presentation as a starting point. I wanted to create a typographic system that could be recognizable at every scale, and one that could invite animation and interactivity. Um, as you scroll, the song plays, but unfortunately, because we're it's copyright issues with streaming, we uh, can't play them, but you can just imagine some incredible music playing. Um, and this project's a real example of how our team's working now, uh, balancing both formats and really honing the way that storytelling can be emphasized online. And I have to give a special shout out to the team because this is a huge collaboration and, which, um, yeah. Of course, it also translated to print as well. We featured Mary J. Blige on the cover, photographed by Ariel Bob Willis, um, who also shot all the subjects photographed throughout the issue. And musicians notoriously have challenging schedules to arrange shoots with, so an issue full of 25 different artists meant that we had to rely on a lot of illustration as well. We commissioned 14 different artists and illustrators to create porches throughout the issue that reflected the tone and attitude of, of the songs. And I especially love this one here um, for the song We Don't Talk About Bruno uh, from the film and Canto, it was, uh, which was commissioned as a collaboration by Pablo Delcon and his three-year-old son, Rio. And here are a few more pages from the issue. And for the last issue, I'm going to show issue 390. Uh, it picks up on a similar theme of uh, celebrating performance from the year. For the last 18 years, the magazine has run a great performers issue dedicated to the best performances from the year chosen by our critics, uh, performances in film from the year. In 2020, because the pandemic meant people weren't in the theaters, our editors decided to open up the issue to performers in film, television, and uh, social media apps. Aiming to celebrate the performers who we're experiencing on our screens and in our homes. And my process is very iterative, so it's a little exposing here showing you all these uh, sketches, but um, for me approaching a special issue at the New York Times Magazine, it's always an exciting intimi and intimidating process. Even after designing 24 of them now, I still find myself with the fear and questions of if I have a clue what I'm doing. The intrusive thoughts enter, perhaps somehow everything I did before was the best work I'll ever do, or maybe it was just luck. And then I'll move a few things around and get that same thrill or feeling that I had the first time I made something that felt new or interesting. 
and then things start to move freely. Um, okay. <laughs> um, so for this issue, rather than uh, rather than design picking up on a, from a referential place, uh, I was responding to the chaos and claustrophobia and the unraveling that we were all experiencing. The type became an illustration of the moment that we were in. And throughout, disrupted the grid and moved around and jostled. The system emphasized consistency and scale and a sense of hierarchy, but sought to shift from page to page. And here's how it appeared online, which I found it really interesting, maybe an unexpected to see type kind of falling apart this way online, which apparently one of our readers did too. <laughs> but what I can say is at least they use my system. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, let's do another round of applause for all our three presenters this morning. We're going to take a break. Please be back here for more typography. Come back at 11.55. We'll see you soon. It's 
all about humanity. That's why they call her criminal. Yeah, she posting on the gram, looking loyal on the digital. When you see her IRL, she faking cause she typical. Look out for myself, I'm so tired of chasing. Could have made it back from the time I've been wasted. Said she understands, but I'm on the floor wasted. Open up to her when I know I should've say shit. Told you how I felt, but that shit wasn't enough. We were having something special, but you had to fuck it up. I won't ever open up, not to you or anyone. Hate the person I become, cause I'm screaming fuck. Fuck love. I'm fucking on the bitch like fuck. Oh, oh. Sucking on the kid like oh my god. I'ma need a quick pro fall. Get down on your knees and give me some. I don't need no toxic hope. Toxic hope. I'ma keep a physical feel for the love. I don't need emotions, no. I'ma keep a simple fuck love. Questioning the wise, why you always gotta leave me broken too? You said you don't know who's the old you. I just wanna know what you're going through. If I were in your shoes, I'd go too. Why didn't you just tell me that I love you? What impression's been creeping up on me again? Now you're telling me you miss sleeping with my friends. I don't ever wanna fucking see you again. And I know I said that last time, but this time is the so end. I'm fucking on this bitch like fuck. Sucking on a kid like oh my god. I'ma need a quick phone call. Get down on your knees and give me some.
no drug dealers, I can't blame them, no, I can't change them, they know me, they think I'm crazy, but I'm the same one, I stay true, but I can't blame you, ain't got the same blood, fuck them, yeah. no can do, no, I can't stand you, so I just sit back, I had her and I had you too, and I don't miss that, that chopper, I call it driver, got that kid back, it's ice, so you call it Michael, and that's a mismatch. And if I die today, will you please visit my mama on the holidays and tell her this shit's gonna be alright? Everything's gonna be alright. And if I die today, will you please visit my mama on the holidays and tell her this shit's gonna be alright? Everything's gonna be alright. Looking back on my whole life, can you look me in my eyes and say you down to die tonight? Deep inside, I feel I'm drowning. I don't panic on the surface. Every Friday, I'm in service. Pray to God, he thinks I'm worth it. You don't really want no problems with a boss like me. You don't know what it costs. You don't floss like me. Fuck a blue check. I need blue cheese. Celery, shorty, please. I can feel like 20 G's in my dungaree. Whoa, whoa. Make it walk like a pro. I just reached another mode. Fit into the mold like woo woo. What's the chance I grow tonight? I've been trying to see these blessings. I'm still blinded by the light, like woo woo. And if I die today, will you please visit my mama on the holidays and tell her this shit's gonna be alright? Everything's gonna be alright. And if I die today, will you please visit my mama on the holidays? Take some dark black pants mm. Cause you were so fine that I got paralyzed When I looked you in the eyes How do we end up here tonight? Just a shot of tequila, you started moving I said, you know, we're side side How we young start, girl? Turn around and look at me When I start dark eyes And I couldn't resist, girl So, I kissed you in the I'm addicted to you tonight. The story's written for you and I. You stole my heart right away that night. Under the stars above the sky. I'm addicted to you tonight. The story's written for you and I. You stole my heart right away that night. Under the stars above the sky. I'm a. We left the club around three to go back to my place. We jumped in the cab and rode along for an hour or so. When we got home, we lay in the couch on our lawn till we both passed out with your hand in mine. Just a shot of tequila, you started moving like Selena. We on the side side. How we young start, girl? Do you turn around and look at me when I start dark eyes? And I couldn't resist, girl. So I kissed you instantly. Put the spotlight around the dance for a reason. I'm addicted to you tonight. The story is written for you tonight. You stole my heart right away that night. On the stars above the sky. I'm addicted to you tonight. The story is written for you tonight. You stole my heart. I'm 
tell the story to my friends and they'll tell me to get over it, try to get over it, but I can never make amends, so I don't think I'll get over it, I'ma have to call it quits, yeah.
where it came from. Got you back in with the passion. I'm awake with the flame and a hailstorm. I'm back in, I gotta have it. Everything to do with what you get to me. Losing in my breath, let's move you and just me.
to dream about money about a big house but all i want is you 
Don't touch your fire when you love me. Just sorry, right, pull the table, boy. Get yeah, all I want is you. We are all the same. Fame, attention, confirmation. Why do we care? What is it worth? What is it worth? We are all the same. We want to be loved. But that is not the same as being loved by you. We are all the same. We want to be loved. But that is not the same as when I'm the against the wind but all i want is you i know that fire when you touch me my vision gets so dimmed yeah all i want is you we are all the same fame attention confirmation why do we care what is it worth what is it worth we are all the same we want to be loved, but that is not the same as being loved by you. We are all the same. We want to be loved, but that is not the same as when I'm loved by you. By you. By you. What is it all worth? We are all the same. We want to be loved, but that is not the same as being loved. Thank you. 
Welcome back. You guys ready for round X, whatever we are? Amazing, amazing, amazing. So we have two more wonderful presentations before we take a lunch break. Before we do that, we'd like to uh, give a word from our sponsors. So enjoy that for a second. I'm Matthew Rex with Business Letters. I'm a business coach for creative people. For years I ran type at Adobe. Now I'm here to help make your type business more successful. Clients hire me for my business experience. They know that I truly care about them and that I truly care about type. Uh, also, a quick a plug for Dual Type who do our wonderful animation. So, thanks you to them. Um, we have our first spotlight uh, for today. Um, we'll have two more in the uh, second half of the section. Um, please enjoy the short, lovely video by Kyle. Hello, Typographics. Happy Pride. 
My name is Kyle Lutender, and I am a lettering artist, illustrator, type designer, and a bit of a magpie for all things shiny and queer. Uh, I'm nothing if not a sissy. I like to use my work to talk about my queer experience, talk about this tension between softness and the hardness of a heteropatriarchal society, which is to say I am nothing if not a shady queen. And I think this year, perhaps more than others in recent memory, this reminder that pride was a riot, a response to targeted attacks against the community, it feels especially meaningful and topical given everything that's been going on. I hope this isn't news to you, but this pride has certainly felt a lot different to the last couple or to ones that I've experienced being alive. More than just the usual ham-fisted, slap a rainbow on things version of pride that we've become so accustomed to, I think we're experiencing a lot of backlash that's happening in record speed. A lot of brands rolling out pride collections or even just logos and experiencing tremendous backlash, taking them off the shelves or off their avatars overnight. It's pretty wild to behold. I think, unfortunately, this becomes more evident as time goes on that to be queer is to have one's existence, validity, and dignity up for debate constantly within the greater culture's discussions. Uh, I've been lucky enough to work on a couple of projects that felt especially meaningful, and I, I wanted to bring them up just perhaps to an audience of folks that are in positions to start some of these projects, perhaps, and what things about them felt the most meaningful. This was a series of uh, quotes that were commissioned by Penguin Random House. They were all from books by queer authors that had been banned by hateful anti-queer laws uh, and all sorts of crazy, insane things going on. To be a part of this, to have billboards go up in states where those laws were being enacted was deeply meaningful. Uh, similarly, this project was, was kind of on its nose, a little goofy, doing some underwear. Uh, became really meaningful when I was able to direct a good portion of that money to a charity, in this case, SAGE, which looks after LGBTQ plus elders who are often forgotten about within our own community and uh, often isolated from their own families. So I think now is an especially meaningful time to support living LGBTQIA plus folks. Supporting our work, supporting queer designers, it gives a sense of security and safety that can be difficult to find when just turning on the news or checking your Twitter feed. So I wanted to use this space to highlight some type designers that are of the queer persuasion, whose work I think is fantastic and perhaps you'll find a use for. This is by no means an exhaustive list, but just a couple I wanted to highlight. Of course, Dan Radigan, everyone's friend, he's such a sweetheart and he just launched Bijou Type. It's a gorgeous collection of typefaces that all are inspired by queer magazines, which is super fun. Dan is every bit as kind as he is, as he is talented. And I'm really, really happy for him with what he's releasing with Bijou. Gorgeous. I also really love Ro Hernandez. She has a couple of really beautiful fonts on future fonts. This one is Puffling that just last week got a really major uh, update. It now has a bunch more sizes. I think it looks gorgeous from every angle, from every size. She also has one called Pigeonette, which is a lot of fun too for more text-based things. Uh, I think the italic is especially dreamy. Perhaps, you know, Fercozzi, who does a lot of really wild typefaces that are just a ton of fun to play with, especially. Uh, yeah, her work is just bombastic and full of life. Ando Boyan, I believe she just got into type media, so congratulations, Ando. She operates under the name of Daytona Mess and is absolutely worth a follow on Twitter, especially where her output and her curiosity around type is infectious. Uh, Robin Menchies runs Tiny Type Co., full of really beautiful, super useful, really meticulous typefaces. And Will Schuster, who I believe also got into type media, congrats, Will. He operates under Queer Type. This is his project from Tape at Cooper, uh, and I think it's a lot of fun. If you are in a position to hire queer folks for type design, for web stuff, for illustration, there's a great resource called queerdesign.club. Uh, it's organized based on cities, based on specialties, and it's a really great resource if you are looking to add folks to your team. I hope that you'll consider adding some queer folks to, uh, to the mix. We certainly uh, have a lot to add and uh, I really thank you for your time. Happy Pride, stay strong out there, give everybody a hug, go support a local drag queen. Thank you, Kyle. Kyle, are you here? I think I saw you in the back. Please give a huge warm hand for, for Kyle right there. Kyle's the best. Um, we're going to 
bouncy tape. We're going to um, transition to another uh, presentation. So our next presenter is Ying Chang, uh, who is a Taper Cooper student, who's welcome back to Cooper Union. Wonderful to have all these links. Um, she was here in 2014. Ying has since embraced a unique lifestyle as a typographic nomad, uh, traveling the world to spread her knowledge via workshops uh, and lectures while working as design director for a variety of brands. Witnessing the growth of others makes her heart smile, and it teaches her precious lessons about herself. In her talk, Ying will describe her process, share design tips, and shows how her typographic practice has shaped the way she exists in the world. Please enjoy Ying's talk. Hi, welcome to Flowing Letters. I am more than honored to be speaking here at Cooper Union, where my passion for letters was discovered. Speaking here is something I did not even dare to dream, like dream of 10 years ago when I took the first step into Kara's italic calligraphy class. In this talk, I will be talking about my constant pursuit of tranquility within shapes and space, about how I approach letters, how the practice reflects on my life, how they always influence and have significant effects on each other. So we will start at the very beginning. This is me. <laughs> I'm Ing, and somehow in my memory, my first bicycle was yellow, but this picture proves that you cannot really rely on your memory that much. I am Taiwanese, and I was born and raised on the east coast of Taiwan. I also have really, really cool parents, as you can see. That's where I got this from. That um, my, also my parents are artists. They are both, uh, they are both calligraphers, and my dad, he also used to carve the Chinese seals. They would host um, classes at home, and I sometimes would learn it with other students, but apparently not too much, because before I came to Cooper, I didn't take typography seriously. But I am sure there is a lot of influence that they gave me. So fast forward to coming to New York. I moved to New York to attend uh, Pratt Institute for the communication design program. And when I first got here, um, a friend of mine visited me from LA. We went to Times Square because that's where everyone goes in New York, right? And um, there are people selling these graffiti on hats on the street. She went to these people and she said like, hey, I want a hat, but I want my friend to draw it. Can we do that? And they happily agree. So I was standing in the middle of Times Square drawing on a hat 15 years ago. <laughs> a week later, I was walking past my Times Square because that where, that's where New Yorkers go. That I was stopped by someone said, hey, are you that girl who drew on the hat the other day? I said, yeah. Then I got my first job in New York. <laughs> so during the time, I wasn't, I always liked type, but I never know what I was really doing. It's more like a doodling, like I just do it for fun. And the people I work with, they actually do graffiti. They grew up in New York City. They, they go out to do graffiti. They show me a bunch of things. So I had the best time there. At the moment, my English was really bad. <laughs> so I always had like hard time communicating. So they were jokingly saying, I speak English. And I have been using this as my tag, with as my handle everywhere. And I think it's really funny. <laughs> Then fast forward to when I decided to sign up for a calligraphy class here without knowing what Western calligraphy is. 
because in my head, calligraphy is Chinese, calligraphy with brush. So I didn't know. I signed out because the agency I was working at, they were sponsored courses, like why not? Then I was immediately interested and wanted to learn more. It's not till I took the first lettering class in 2013 with Ken Barber, and of course, the second one. <laughs> then I was like, wow, I guess this is how it feels when you are doing what you are supposed to be doing. I just felt this instant connection because before this, I always struggle with like, what, what should I do? Am I a graphic designer? Am I an illustrator? I never really found like a perfect place for me to comfortable sit at, and then this happened. And I was like, why does no one ever told me about lettering before? How come I never know this is a thing before? And I was super happy that I was able to find this and had like a really, really good mentor along the way. So I'm breaking my journey into sections to take you through. And the first chapter is water. I have always enjoyed being by the water, river, lake, ocean. The senior high school I went to in Taiwan is just across the street from the Pacific Ocean, and I probably skipped too many classes to just sit there and look at the ocean. But what does water have to do with lettering? When Kara explaining letter spacing, let's imagine pouring water into the space they should hold similar amount of value. When it's space very open, the amount of water should also stay similar. So just like all these containers, all these cups and bottles, they are different shapes, but they hold the same amount of liquid. So maybe it's just me, but my mind was blowing. I don't know. Do, did you guys know that? <laughs> like, I, no, no one has ever told me about it before. So everything just makes sense. And I fell into this really um, strong connection with the rhythm. When you think about the wave, it comes in and out. And I started working on pieces that's focusing more on the overall texture, the in and out, and the space between how it's evenly spread out. And I also do cartouche. And I love to just find out a place to equally divide the space and make everything comfortable. During this time, my drawing and my environment are reflecting on each other. I think I might be a very organized hoarder. Then, from this, I came across minimalism seven years ago. I got rid of about 60 to 70 percent of my belongings and never looked back. Sometimes I do, like, I always forget, like, oh, did I donate that, pan, that pair of pants? But it's gone, so you never know. That also explains why I'm not dressed very fancy today, because I don't really keep any fancy clothes. <laughs> the idea of only keeping what's necessary influences how I approach my letters. Instead of endless flourish, I started focusing on having limited and few extra decoration. I practice on doing it simple, but not lose its personality. Maybe it's just like me, without fancy clothes, without jewelry, but I'm still a person, I still have personality. And special Thanks to Ken again, when I first started drawing letters, I was very distracted by what's out there. I wonder if I should use color, shadow, illustration, other additional design, rather than just the letter form itself. Not that those things are bad at all, but I just don't feel the connection with them. They don't excite me, but the shapes 
and the space, they do. Ken kindly reminded me that I just need to do what I love. So I just continue to arrange my space. So that's why most of my drawings are black and white. Then I also think about being simple is not as, it's so much harder than being an organized hoarder because you don't really need to face what you're dealing with. And as for my life, I started noticing that the less I have, the more space I have available to be free with. I can use more space to welcome friends, to welcome different thoughts, welcome different ideas. I feel more open. The openness of my apartment started to bring me a new outlook on everything. I feel lighter, free, so does my letters. My letters, my letters now don't always require false lashes or a pink blush. Through the practice of minimalism, I experienced the freedom that I've never had before. I became hyper aware of space and how space contributed to my senses. I started creating lettering pieces that heavily re rely on negative space, even use just a hairline to define the letters. When it says tension, it's not only the letters hold the tension, but the very, very tight negative space contribute just as much. Making black letters super tight to have negative space jump out. Designing from organic negative space, how does the letter look like if I think about the negative space first? How I want the black on this example to look like first? Just as we inhale and exhale, there is a letter followed by a space. You can just have one. This reminds me of Zen Cohen. What is the sound of one hand clapping? Is lettering just dualistic? I even explore how to just use really shapes. How does that even read? I think most of you would say that doesn't really read. <laughs> what is space? Is space just empty? Let's look at water, because I said I like water. So here is H2O. And in this molecule, there's so much space. What is that? Comparing the actual quote-to-quote -quote thing and the space, it's so much more. Then when you look closer, to the proton, even though there's so much energy happening, it's mostly empty. So when I look at myself, let's say my hand, I can look at my hand, knowing it's made out of molecule atoms, and you look at that, like it's all empty. Am I? Solid? Am I the emptiness of it? And I got really confused. <laughs> I feel solid, though. <laughs> I hope you do, too. <laughs> and I decided, I guess I'm made of sparkles. <laughs> like, they are parts that exist, and they are the empty part. That's also you. From space. This realization brought me to a new phase, zero. Let's get deeper. <laughs> this is me, solid. And I have five senses, right? The five senses are poking me and bringing me different experience. Wait, so I'm, so I, I'd be just having these senses bringing me experience. What do you mean bringing me? So 
that's not me. Am I making sense? <laughs> so it feels more like this. I am that empty thing inside. When there is a sense is coming, I react. I am the reactions. When there is a sound, I hear. When there is this food, I taste, I smell. If I'm not my senses, I guess I'm not a solid body. I don't understand. So if I'm not my body, do I still have my mind? I think, therefore, I am. Am I my thought? And I started looking at these thoughts. Remember I was talking about space? When you give your thought enough space, your opinion enough space, your judgment or anyone else enough space, you will see that's also not you because it's your brain doing what brain does, it thinks. So from there, I'm like, okay, I guess I'm also not my mind. When I realized that I'm not all these things, I can become everything because without identifying with all these senses and the, any opinion, judgment that comes to your mind, you are able to just explain. You can go through and pass by all the things and have a smile on your face all the time <laughs> because nothing that comes might be bad. You, sh you don't need to identify with it. It's not you. So, if I am the space, I am the emptiness, and then I am nothingness. Once I realize this, I have the ability to expand the space that I am. I will be all nothing, yet everything. Like expanding through the whole the universe. When you look at the sky, you're like, that's empty. I'm going to extend there. <laughs> Sometimes I do like under the sky or especially in New York City, you don't see many stars. So you have a lot of open space to imagine that's you. You are extending, expanding there. So I, re I revisited some drawings I did and try to see if I can write on the feeling, creating something that expand and grow in the space. So from what I always do, I discover I can do something that's growing. While learning the center cannot hold, <laughs> I want to bring you a quote. If you look at zero, you see nothing. But look through it, you will see the world. This is by a mathematician in a book, The Nothing That Is, A Natural History of Zero. It is a book really about math, so <laughs> I didn't read it. I only read this quote. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't really recommend it unless you're super into math, but there is some good takeaway that's Sounds mindful. <laughs> and this really led me to where I am right now, adaptability, and I cannot spell. And they say you learn some, so much about yourself through traveling. And it is true that I found myself in a hostel dorm of 12 people in Scotland, I thought I would suffer. <laughs> I was so worried because I'm spoiled. I don't, I didn't want to share a bathroom. I didn't, I want my own room. I need a comfort. But all the rooms are sold out. This was my only option. And I was very worried, like how terrible of a time I'm going to be having. But then I was there. I ended up not spending a second being unhappy with the squeaky bats. Unidentified smile, smell, 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 yes. Or the sheer shower that's, that only trickles. I was there, as is, accepting my surrounding, the reality, as is. 
After this trip, I went to a magical place called Svalbard that inspired this drawing. In the summer, it's 24 hours day, day, and in the winter, it's 24 hours darkness. When I was there, I learned so much about myself. I always, I used to have fear about height, but I was there on this mountain. Everyone's going up, left, it's down, right, it's down. What am I gonna do? At, at that moment, I decided to give it space. I was putting a space between myself and the fear. I was still sensing there's height. I don't like this, but I didn't have to identify with it. Just the same as the bottom right corner of a picture that's in the cave. I couldn't go in. <laughs> when I decided not to go in, I was left behind and I was sitting in the cave in the darkness with my own head torch alone. And then the fear was right here. They were all right there, but I gave it space. And then I don't have to stick with it. It's not me. So I realized adaptability is a superpower. And spelling is a power that I don't have. So this all brought me to the last project I'd like to share with you. It's my own branding project. I made my first logo 2010 before I know what I got to learn what lettering is. So I really needed to redesign my logo, but just like every designer would say, it's impossible to design for yourself. So I, I started thinking, what do people say about my work? And when I realized what people say the most is the variety, the, the different styles I'm able to do. So maybe I don't do just one logo then, because if my ability is to adapt and be comfortable with any given space and shapes, perhaps having as many logos as possible is the best way to describe me as a lettering artist. So currently, at this moment, I have 50 English logos <laughs> that they are all living on England.org. <laughs> this project is still ongoing, and I, it will only continue to grow. Through the practice of giving it space, the idea of water turned into emptiness, nothingness, and that became everything. These all carry me to make the decision to give up my worldly possession last November to start travel full time. Never could I guess that at my very first stop, I will have my luggage delayed for one week. And this is everything I had for a week in the Arctic. <laughs> I think that's the universe trying to prove to me that I can live with even less. I will end with a quote. We live in illusion, the, the appearance of things, but there is a reality, and we are the reality. When you understand that, you see that you're nothing, and being nothing, you're everything. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ying. It was wonderful. Um, we're fast approaching lunch break, which is a great time to visit the book fair if you haven't, and especially so because our next presenter is going to be signing books there, something she'll be discussing in her talk. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Farida Mareb, uh, who will discuss the hybrid cultural landscape of Venezuela through the work of two designers, Carmel Izola and Victor Vallejo. Their work for state-funded publications and independent magazines was influenced by migration, 
political context and by local aesthetics. Farid is a Venezuelan book designer, art director, and researcher currently based here in New York City. Embracing her Caribbean and Middle Eastern heritage and her profound love for books, she directs the design studio and research center, Letra Muerta Inc. Please welcome Farida. Hi, everyone. After uh, that precious lecture, I feel like the loud neighbor. Um, um, so as Sasha said, my name is Farida, and most of what interests me about design is hybridity, um, because it reflects not only in design, but in techniques, in culture, and in media. But hybridity doesn't come for free. Um, the design tradition of Venezuela, like any other Latin American country, is characterized by it. And this is part of its appeal, but we, al we also should remember that this hybridity is a result of colonization and how abuses to our communities have shaped our identity. So we should be very careful not to romanticize uh, the results of this process. <clears throat> Um, instead, we can emphasize, for example, new forms that we create amongst ourselves. Tambores. No, 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 otra vez no, porfa, no. Okay. <laughs> Now I need uh, a volunteer. No, I'm joking. <laughs> so, for example, tambores is a genre that comes as a result of African drums and Venezuelan celebrations. And in that sense, history is also a mashup uh, of the history we know from books and our own oral tradition. Um, we have to become explorers, navigating undiscovered bibliographical material and lack of representation until we can reach um, the results we want. So I grew up in a half Lebanese, half Venezuelan family, so I'm kind of like Shakira. <laughs> and here's my father playing baseball. Um, baseball is a national, national sport in Venezuela. And it was very sunny, and instead of wearing, wearing a hat, he just decided to make a turban out of a bed sheet. <laughs> so this is just one of the many examples of how wonderful things happen when our cultures intertwine. So what makes a design Venezuelan? Um, I was asking myself, trying to frame this question in few words, and I decided to borrow concepts from industrial design analysis. One author I really like is Givon Siepe. So one of the things I could say is that it borrows from local, um, from the locality in shape or in aesthetic. It's a part of a system that lives within that cultural context. It conveys the use of material or processes from that specific place. Uh, I know it's a bit romantic, but what was it made from a person from that place? Um, does it follow a line of tradition or frame of work? And does it come up with solutions to a local problem? So all of these um, Different scenarios are some that we can take from uh, one area to another and ask ourselves how we can define the culture, the visual culture of a country. Um, there were certainly a lot of people working in what we know today as graphic design in Venezuela earlier in the 20th century. One example of that is Carlos Cruz Diaz. 
Many of us might know him from his kinetic work, but besides Cruz Diaz, a lot of designers migrated to Venezuela. So today, Venezuela has the, lar the largest refugee crisis recorded in the Americas, and the number of people fleeing the country is similar to the numbers in Syria and Ukraine. But back in the day, everybody wanted to live in Venezuela and migrate to Venezuela. I have a theory that there's three main reasons. First uh, would be oil. A lot of cash was flowing. The naturalization of the oil industry kept everything in welfare. The laws after the dictatorship ended made it very easy for people to get naturalized and practice their trade. People were actually encouraged uh, to develop their careers when they arrived, once they arrived. And the weather was amazing. <laughs> Um, we actually have two seasons, like summer and summer with a little bit of rain, that's it. So with these massive migrations uh, came what we know, what came the people that we know as design pioneers or Venezuela's design pioneers. Here we see Nedo came from Italy, La Reunion from the US, and Leufert from Germany. Also, uh, there's a very important name I'd like to mention, Hans Neumann, from what used to be Czechoslovakia. He was one of the only survivors of his family from the Nazi regime. Uh, they were actually 34, and 25 of them were killed. Because of him, the biggest company of paints in Venezuela was funded, and the Neumann Design Institute, the first official design institute in Venezuela, was funded. Plot twist. There's a particular um, case uh, that I would like to point out, which is the one of, am I getting a lot of, like, which is the case of Leufer. Um Designer Alvaro Sotillo, who was a student at the Neumann Institute, um, became Leufert's mentee. And he had commented about a sort of linguistic spin in his work. I'm going to let him say it. Entonces uno, se, uno en el acto piensa, bueno, ¿qué pasó aquí? ¿Cómo, cómo llega este hombre? Porque él llegó aquí así. ¿Cómo hace este hombre? ¿Cómo, ¿Cómo produce una imagen de esta racionalidad? A mí me parece que esto está ya en el mundo, o sea, tocando el concepto como de ciencia, de una racionalidad mental... So on the right, we see that example of a very figurative work that he made, what he was making when he was in Germany. And on the right, uh, the sort of endless he started to develop when he arrived in Venezuela. Um, then on the right, we have another example that's really important. We have an indigenous chest plate that inspired the logo of one of the biggest airports in the country. So that tells you a lot about the parallels in between um, ancestral culture and technological advance, which is something very, very present within our communities. Um, Leufer in Venezuela, uh, he arrived in the 50s. And here we can see in the, in the middle some spreads from Imposibilia, designed by Dolores Sotillo, with some of his emblems. But what I really want to focus on in this case is the Nenia series on the right. These nenas had been said to evoke uh, indigenous figures, letter forms, and even close people to Leufert had said that he mentioned he seek to evoke or remind the amputated bodies after the war. So how come an emblem contains so much uh, meaning and history? Modernism picked after the 40s in Venezuela, as I said, because of the oil boom, an abstraction became a language spoken by many. Here we see examples by Nedo um, and some examples from Leufert by Imposibilia. Another example from Revista Cal, Critica Arte y Literatura, the alphabet of metasignosis. And on my end, although I did receive formal education, most of my book design knowledge comes really directly from working with printer Javier Aispurva, also an immigrant in Venezuela. He had printed not only Leufert's books, but also Alvaro Sotillo's. And in that sense, I decided to follow the tradition of mentorship. And with the political crisis and the collapse of the oil industry, it was apparent that 
this made a scene not only in the economy, but also in libraries, in hospitals, and in the supermarkets because they were empty. So I decided to follow tradition and migrate as well. This is what the process to migrate to the US looks like. Just a reference. Remember the, the oil, the weather, the loss. This is the equivalent for the US. Um, and that made me think of stories of migration, not only of my own, but other people's. Migration works in funny ways because it not only makes us displaced geographically, but it also puts us in a weird mental space where we are trying to figure out who we are and the space we occupy in a new location. So I remember this story that I was told when I arrived to the printing press that Juan Fresan in the 60s, a designer from Argentina, uh, he designed this book, by the way. Um, he, arrived to his first, <laughs> he arrived to his first job interview in a hearse because the owner of a funeral home gave him a lift. And yes, he got the job. And um, on my end, I think that I was a really good sandwich maker when I was hired in a restaurant when I arrived in NYC because I believed that I could translate my experience from binding books into, you know, bread. <laughs> Some of you might know I just opened a design studio in Brooklyn with my friend and business partner, Oriana Nusi. She's in the audience. Hey, Oriana. <laughs> And in Letra Muerta, we mostly specialized in book design. And besides design, we process archives, some of them literary, some of them visual arts, and other design. We try to continue to create new resources uh, and sources of information for consultation and new ways to shape our own histories. Back in Venezuela, Letra Muerta functioned until 2018, mostly as a publishing house. This is some of the work we have been doing. And under this imprint, uh, many research-based projects got published, like this one, Es Una Buena Máquina, and more research. Then this one, Al Filo, Poemas by Ida Gramco, Espacios para Decir Lo Mismo de Janioso. This was bilingual and had three spines. The Private Life of Ragdolls, uh, this one had the index on the cover, and so on. These are other books we have made, books specifically about Venezuela. More books. Yeah, so hire me, you know. Um, in that process of publishing and researching, I came across many names, like Carmela Leizaolas, people that history seemed to just have completely forgotten. Carmela Leizaola was actually the first woman that we know of to work as a graphic designer in Venezuela. If we go back uh, a few slides, we can remember that most of the design pioneers we discussed were all men. Most of them came from Europe. So it's always hard to try to find yourself in design history and, and not see anyone who you might feel similar with or represented. Carmela arrived in the 40s, running away from the Spanish Civil War and the end of World War II. Um, there are a lot of connections between her work and what was going on in Europe. Uh, here are some parallels side by side, from image repetition for bass in compositions to the use of collage, examples by Hannah Hawk or John Hartfield. After winning our research grant in 2021, I created this timeline uh, of her life and work and the political context. It took me about a year to reconstruct, reconstruct her life through the publications she participated in. This was particularly hard because most of the publications never credited her or other women. And although she didn't receive credit for her work in the early stages of her career, she started as a layout designer for Elite Magazine. Her father, Ricardo Leizaola, worked as a printer and photographer, and he was the first to bring a machine of hueco grabado, or rotogravur, to Venezuela, the same machine in which Cal Magazine was printed. In magazines like Momento, the use of white space in the composition was very characteristic. Images came across spreads, and oil-dominated subjects were present. She was an activist in the Acción Democrática Party 
and design their periodical. Protests and multitudes grew like texture on their pages, and most of this work was not credited to anyone because of fear of repercussions and being disappeared. She also worked in Bohemia magazine. This was a Cuban publication, and ironically, here you can see Celia Cruz. Celia Cruz is a salsa superstar. Uh, she left Cuba and was really outspoken against the dictatorship. And here she's dressed for some reason in traditional flamenco clothing. <laughs> There's also a, a happy drunken couple bathing a baby in a river <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> Venezuela. Um, Imagen, in Imagen magazine, she designed the header. So mainly asymmetrical composition uh, was present. Again, her use of white space, which is something her colleagues mentioned a lot. And the use of photography in black and white with flat blocks of color overlapping. With newspapers, uh, it was very specific because um, she was the first woman to ever occupy or lead an editorial department. She started working in 79, so <laughs> until 79, not even one woman led an editorial department. Um, she used silhouettes and rhythmic compositions uh, as one of her staples. And her experience in magazines led her to have a unique approach in how she designed um, newspapers, which had a faster pace of working. In her later stages, she worked in Venezuela magazine. And here she also got to collaborate with her daughter, Stivelis Laceras, who is currently also a designer. So in the timeline I mentioned, oh, I fucked up. No. What am I doing wrong? There we go. In the timeline I mentioned um, before, it's actually part of uh, a publication. It has three different parts. It's a newspaper. It also became a Wikipedia page, a physical exhibition, and a website. I was also left with thousands of images that need cataloging, editing, organizing. So as you can see, this is more than only one year of work. I also found about other women designers like Soledad Mendoza, who migrated from Colombia and is someone that I'm currently researching on as well. Another designer worth mentioning is Victor Viano. Victor fled from Argentina running away from a coup. Are you starting to see the connections here? Uh, running away from a coup as a result of the revolution and arrived in 68 in Venezuela. I wrote a bit about him in 2019 for the blog of Alphabets. Thank you, Alphabets. And it helped me organize my ideas and begin to explore further. Victor worked as an illustrator in Argentina and also worked in marketing. He came to Venezuela after winning a design competition that allowed him to come with a job and a legal status to do art direction in Venezuela. He worked at Ricardo de Luca advertisement. And back in the day, that company led all the campaigns for Gillette. So when he arrived in Venezuela, he was mostly like with marketing bros and you know working in those campaigns. He got tired of it and decided to dedicate himself almost completely to the design of book covers. I like to do emphasis a lot on the fact that he was able to come because of this design competition, because I think sometimes we, we miss the point that with design competitions, there are many other elements besides winning an award. These uh, instances also bring opportunities and op open doors for people who want to migrate to the US or to other countries. That's actually my case. I was able to come to the US because of that. Later, Victor used his illustration skills to dedicate himself almost completely to book design. And here we can see some of his sketches and also drawings from when he was in art school in Argentina. The knowledge of drawing led him to incorporate some of his own uh, portraits in final covers. Here we see two examples from Monte Avila de Torres. Monte Avila de Torres was one of the biggest state-funded publishing houses. He also designed their catalogs, their posters. Many of the covers that I grew up with in Venezuela were from this publishing house, which um, was also <laughs> impulsed uh, by oil. Although some collections did follow guidelines, other titles seem to stand out on their own 
and only connected through the way the type was set. Um, most of the first publications uh, of these publishing houses, not only Monte Avila, and in the case specifically of Monte Avila, were printed by Javier Aispurua, the printer that I mentioned in the beginning. Many of the covers uh, we see here were his bread and butter, but he also made posters, for example, this one for Claudia y Alberto Gambino, and also some logos. And one of the later stages of his work was the one who actually led me to this research. In 2017, I asked online, trying to figure out who made the logo of Ediciones Mandorla. And a couple of years later, I had the original paste up in my hands. Here we can see part of the process. In Venezuela, we only have officially two books that were published on graphic design, one in the 60s and one in the 90s, um, both of them funded by oil. One was uh, financed by Maraven, and the other one by Fundación La Estancia. Um, most of my, so this means that most of my questions from um, after the 90s or regarding people that are not men uh, are actually answered by interviewing, searching adjacent titles, or asking around. And then I have to compare my findings with newspapers, documents, and do background checking. We call that método de la triangulación in Venezuela. It's like when you contrast all the sources. In the Mandorla cover, we see type as the main compositional element and ornamented borders. After some searching and looking at records, they turn out to be from Enskede. He also used a lot of letra set and paste ups. I was lucky enough to meet with Luisa Antonioli in her house in Spain. She was an architect, a tenure professor in Venezuela. Um, she was also Victor's wife. Victor died in the 2000s. Um, and she sent part of Victor's archive to me to New York. And when I visited her, I brought back two full suitcases to try to process Victor's archive. Um, one thing that unfortunately stuck with me was how she constantly mentioned, or repeatedly mentioned, that Victor did not get the recognition he deserved while he was alive. Oh, here in the middle, we can see my husband, Samu. I always like to include him uh, because he's the one carrying the suitcases. <laughs> um, here's the freaky air tables that we work with in the studio. Oriana bared with me for over a year, trying to make sense of this archive, which was made of um, not only illustrations, sketches, but also actual physical books. He kept most of uh, copies of each of the books. And with, how am I on time? With the archive being in New York and after two full years of work, uh, Viano's collection was already finally in good shape, decently processed and digitized. And the archive was recently acquired by the University of Toronto. It will be available for consultation by appointment in the Fisher Library of Rare Books. Venezuela. The funds resulting from it are being distributed between Victor's family um, and going towards shipping costs of other two archives we're bringing to be processed and continue this type of work, like the one we did with Carmela and the one with Victor. Um, I recently published a short book with Catherine Small Gallery in Boston, and this book features Go, Catherine, small gallery, yay. Uh, this book features a small compilation of Victor's work and I text I wrote. And there are many, many more images besides the one on this book. So I do wish to explore more about the work of this and other designers. And one of the main reasons I was excited to speak here today and fucking terrified is I would be grateful if you have any leads on institutions that are doing similar work with Latin American designers or individual scholars, since I want to make this project grow and build more connections. You can support these two publications. I will be having a little book signing 
on the book fair from 1.30 to 3-ish at Catherine Small Gallery's table. Y gracias. Thank you so much, Farida. Um, catch Farida at the book signing. Uh, first, let's give a huge warm uh, applause for everyone who spoke today so far. We have five amazing speakers, and we have five more amazing speakers. So we'll see you at 3 o'clock back here on Adopt. Enjoy some food and think about the stuff you saw. We'll see you soon.
You dead, motherfucker. I just can't let you go Lord knows that I've tried to You said I was the only one No one likes being like to You made this mess and left me with the pieces Now I wanna burn all the bridges between us
It's a tug of war Battling to keep my sanity Say no more, say no more I love you but I can't keep killing me I look at myself, I wonder why you Don't recognize who, you traumatize me Now what do I do? Pick up the pieces and go
the fuck with you niggas on? Cause I'm on a billion better things, yeah, yeah. I don't want no smoke. These niggas, they wanna tell everything, yeah, yeah. And my bitch is beautiful, and I ain't in the teeth, and that's for hey, yeah. Remember my pockets were small, but I focus up, and now I'm up on my bread, yeah. Remember I ain't had shit. It was about five of us in the same space. When I cheat on the mattress, they didn't feel me if you was in the same place. And that bitch was an actress. I ain't know she could lie, but a straight face. I would tell you what happened. But I said I told God when I say my grace. So I'm thankful for my past. That she landed me in my bag. Now I'm up my ex bitch mad. Cause she know she did me bad. And look, I don't hold grudges. But I went through all that bullshit for nothing. But now I'm on something. And I used to be broke. I was still out of public. So my mom was fighting. Talking about we had rent, but we end up with notices on the oven. And I ain't here for sex, now that shit's overrated, I'm here for your loving. Hey, but don't get me wrong, I be feeling the vibe every time that we fucking. And next time I get head, baby, just use your throat, I don't want you to touch it. I just touch on the LAX, girl, bring over the vibes, Lord. I won't go back and forth no more, I don't got time for it. This time last year I was broke, I ain't had nothing to ground for it. But the shit switched up and man, oh man, I just thank God for it. I ain't had no hope no more, nah. I'm praying on something to come and save me, time and took its course off. And I won't take time to know you, how I'm blank, please take your shorts off. And I know I'm grimy, but I'm scarred, no heart, I'm just a corpse off. You fuck with you niggas on, cause I'm on a big end, better these, yeah, yeah. And I don't want no smoke, these niggas, they run and tell everything, yeah, yeah. And my bitch is beautiful, and I ain't in the cheating unless it's for hair, yeah. yeah. Remember my pockets are small, but I focus up and now I'm up in my prayer, yeah. You fuck with you niggas on, cause I'm on a big end, better things, yeah, yeah. And I don't want no smoke, these niggas, they run and tell everything, yeah, yeah. And my bitch is beautiful, and I ain't in the cheating unless it's for hair, yeah, yeah. Remember my pockets are small, but I focus up and now I'm up in my prayer, yeah. yeah. You fuck with you niggas on, cause I'm on a big end, better things. Yeah, yeah, I don't want no smoke. These niggas, they wanna tell everything. Yeah, yeah, and my bitch is beautiful, and I ain't gonna cheat unless for hey, yeah. Remember my pockets are small, but I focus up and now I'm up in my brain. Do I not think it does even let me take the control? Do I not think it does even let me take the control? Do I not think it does even let me take the Do I not see it on the table and they take the control? Yeah, but I thought I can make it as in your eyes as in your eyes. The body is in the higher, your body is in the fire, baby. I wanna take the control, have you just got love, love, love. Go 
some stuff so today my talk is simply called typography and storytelling this is a preview part one starts in providence rhode island for my degree project senior year sarah highsmith love jensen centaur cuts drawing process starting with calligraphy should i just keep going just keep going okay here's some notes from my professor hans von dyke skip ahead Okay, and it's really it's really to talk about the provenance of its name, which is Robert Weebcam. He's an incredibly prolific yet incredibly underrecognized type designer, and he's an obscure name, even though his body of work is significant. And he has these strong associations to important names like Frederick Gowdy, Bruce Rogers, Middleton, and so on. Even today, there's not a whole lot that you can find about Robert Weebcam. And part of the reason for that is apparently because he was a very shy person with an extreme aversion to the limelight. So anyway, the realization came to me that in the history of type design, not everyone involved always receives their due praise, much like how details are lost in the process of printing, drawing, matrices, cutting.
Welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a nice lunch. At least it wasn't raining, and it was nice out there. Um, and at least it wasn't orange like it was here a week and a half ago. Um, so we have some great speakers for you this afternoon, but we're going to begin with um, our sponsors. dream television station would be all font commercials. Um, so now I'd, we have a spotlight for you about Colin Forbes. I'm Michael Gericke. Um, uh, as you know, Colin Forbes passed away just a little more than a year ago. Um, he was a founding member of Pentagram and the architect of a really unique approach to design. I'd first met Colin in 1984. Um, he was the elegant Englishman with aviator glasses who had recently brought Pentagram, uh, the idea-driven design firm whose work crossed dimensions uh, to America. Um, I was immediately awestruck, uh, inspired, and humbled. Um, he looked a, a bit like Michael Caine or Daniel Craig Planet designer who was also a secret foreign agent. Um, I knew Colin's work, of course, and his partners. Um, he was smart, 
articulate, uh, had a broad knowledge of design history and typography. Um, he freely collaborated with others. He was worldly, kind, and exotically European. Um, he knew what inspires and motivates and bonds a group of idiosyncratic and ego-driven partners. Uh, uh, he also understood what enables good design and the difficult commitments it requires to be a champion for it. Um, Colin retired to a, a wonderful horse farm in the rolling hills of North Carolina. Um, he built barns there, he mended fences, planned future trails, kept track of who and what was where and made sure it all stayed healthy, uh, just like he had for all those years before for all of us here at Pentagram. So in advance of our next speaker, we're going to show you the Wi-Fi passwords again because she's going to be sharing some AR work. And obviously the one on the left is going to be a little easier because it's just one network and one password. Um, Beatriz Lozano is a designer and educator exploring the intersection of physical and digital worlds. Her work harnesses technology to serve overlooked communities. She shifted her focus from mechanical engineering to graphic design when immigrants' rights activism exposed her to the power of visual communication. Beatrice will share some recent, recent projects that use creative coding, augmented reality, and AI. Beatrice teaches interaction design at Parsons and was formerly a design director at Sunday Afternoon. Please welcome Beatrice. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today, and thank you so much for the, to the typographics team for making this possible. As it was mentioned, if everybody could please uh, sign in to the Wi-Fi, um, and then uh, please find me on Venmo. Uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but it will be helpful for the second half of this presentation. And so today I want to uh, speak with you all about the dimensionality of type. And I'll be sharing a few recent projects that explore how we can reimagine leather forms uh, through technology. But before we jump into our favorite subject, which is typography, uh, I want to share a little bit of a background as to why I'm so passionate about this topic. And the impact of advancing technology on communities is something that I have thought about since childhood. And that's because I grew up in Metro Detroit, where my dad was a maintenance electrician at the Chrysler Auto Factory. And I remember one day when I was in third grade, he came home with a newspaper that had a photo printed in it, very similar to the one that we see here. And he explained to my siblings and I uh, that they were bringing in these new machines, these robots into the plant that could now carry out the exact same tasks that were being done by the workers. And he expressed this in a way uh, that showed a bit of concern for his job and the job of his coworkers. Uh, but this fear was equally matched with a level of curiosity and fascination for this new technology, uh, simply because my dad just has a deep love of everything that is electrical and mechanical. And so this duality of the detriments and the benefits that can come with advancing technology is something that I have thought about from a young age and continue to think about well into my college years, uh, especially when I became um, familiar with the works of an incredible philosopher and activist named Grace Lee Boggs. And in turn, I became familiar with the works of her husband, James Boggs, who was also an activist, an author, uh, but before that, he was also a Detroit auto worker. And he was actually writing about the impacts that technology-driven automation can have in our communities as early as the 50s. And specifically, he focused on the disproportional uh, potential this technology has to displace black and brown workers uh, and their families. 
And James cared deeply for the human condition, and he also speculated how automation could help us reevaluate our worth as individuals. Uh, what would our weeks look like if we can now be free of these physically laborious tasks and we can begin to value one another for other contributions, such as our creativity or our thoughts? And uh, this outlook just had a profound impact on my perspective and helps me believe that we have the power to harness technology uh, to create a more positive and equitable future. And so uh, in my work, I have found that there are three main uh, emerging technologies that have greatly impacted uh, me these last few years. And the first is creative coding. And here we could see some of the incredible work uh, from some creative coding pioneers. Uh, next up, we have perhaps my favorite kind of tech, which is extended reality. And extended reality covers everything from fully immersive uh, VR to mixed reality AR. And in my opinion, the pioneers who really were exploring what typography can look like in this space uh, were designers like Zach Lieberman and Dia Studio, whose works we can see here. Um, and they were exploring these uh, techniques as early as 2018. And I feel incredibly privileged that I got the opportunity to learn from both of these designers in different capacities. Uh, but also we have some up and coming designers who will continue to shift the future of this medium, including Rashri Saraf, uh, whose uh, type uh, lab talk I saw a couple days ago and whose work uh, we can see here in the corner. So I definitely suggest that you all uh, watch her talk as well. And lastly, we have uh, maybe perhaps the most popular tech of our current time, which is AI. And unfortunately, we just don't have the time uh, right now to really dive into this topic and the ethics around this topic. But I think we can all agree that it, this is truly a complicated tool and it's still very much in development. And uh, at least for me in the past few months, I have learned to adopt these tools into my workflow. I use AI basically every single day. I use tools like ChatGPT uh, for any coding projects. And then I use programs like MidJourney uh, for any sketch or ideation. And I believe that all three of these emerging technologies can add dimensionality uh, to our type of graphic work. And through a more literal interpretation, uh, we can view dimension as a measure in one direction. And so we can use tools like Cinema 4D or 3JS to add a physical depth to our leather forms the way we can see here, taking a 2DA and extruding it into this kinetic 3DA. But on a more figurative level, we can also understand dimension as a level of existence or consciousness. And this is the perspective that I want to explore with you all today. And through this lens, I believe that technology can add dimensionality to our work uh, by adding layers of accessibility, interactivity, and understanding. And starting off with accessibility, I want to share a few education initiatives that I have been a, a part of uh, this past year. Uh, starting off with Type Electives, which is a new online school that was launched by Juan Villanueva and Lin Yun. And I was part of the inaugural cohort of instructors. And for this school, I put together a five-week course on augmented reality. And this was an intro to AR type class. And fundamentally, I believe that we have technology to thank uh, for making education uh, incredibly uh, accessible these past couple of years, especially throughout the pandemic. With tools like Zoom or Google Meet, anybody from anywhere can now learn about the topics that they are really passionate about. And I believe that this class was no exception. We had students sign up from all across the country, and we even had some international students as well. And here you can see the work that the students created. This was uh, showed here in the city at Wick's Playground. And as always, I'm just incredibly proud of all of the work the students created because uh, once again, this was an intro to AR class. The majority of the students um, had never designed in 3D software. They had no prior experience um, with AR. And so for them to start off at zero and then finish the class with uh, multiple letter forms and really understanding 3D in a new way was incredibly rewarding. 
But perhaps my favorite aspect of this class was that we began to explore the potential of how we can use AI to create AR. And here we could see a screenshot of what this interaction looks like. This is a screenshot from ChatGPT. And here we are using ChatGPT uh, for a student's project where we want a cube to rotate every time it is tapped. And um, I believe that tools, AI tools such as ChatGPT, have the potential to be great equalizers. And what I mean by that is that in order to create a certain level of interactive design, um, you still need some code. And often, for anybody who has coded in the past or attempted to code, uh, you probably now understand that it takes hundreds of hours to get to a level of proficiency uh, where your code can actually help you create the designs that you are imagining. Uh, however, I think that often learning skills like coding are directly linked with financial privilege. If you have hundreds of hours to learn a new skill, you'll probably uh, have some level of privilege that not everybody has access to. And so I believe that tools such as ChatGPT can help eliminate some of these inequalities where anybody who has a strong concept can now use AI to help them create a, a design that has a high level of refinement and interactivity. And I also want to share that I uh, held a condensed version of this workshop uh, just as a one-day workshop in Mexico City last fall. And uh, here we could see all of the incredible work that the students created. And this was an extremely meaningful experience for me uh, because both of my parents are immigrants from Mexico. And I just have a deep love for the community. And I'm a huge admirer of all of the designers that are coming from Mexico and Latin America. And this workshop was held entirely for free with the help of my friends uh, Michael and Nat over at Republic, as well as friends here in the city who helped me translate all of the uh, resources we were using for this workshop. And um, this workshop was held um, entirely in Spanish. Well, I did my best to hold it in Spanish. And um, it was this was an impre imp incredibly important aspect for me because the software that we were using, uh, Spark AR, uh, well, at least as of last year, was only available in English, and the majority of the resources online are all in English. And so uh, this project for me was just a great reminder that as these new technologies continue to be released and continue to evolve, uh, we have to work together and uh, to try and make these new technologies as accessible as possible from people of all backgrounds who speak all languages, uh, because it's not fair to only have a small group of people dictating how these technologies will be impacting our lives. And secondly, I believe that technology can add interactivity. And I'll be sharing uh, two projects uh, that share uh, this belief. And the first one is the system, and this was a project I created for a P5 summer class uh, through Cooper taught by Space Type. And um, in this class, we were exploring glitch designs created with P5. And this class was taking place during the summer of 2020. So this was just after the murder or of George Floyd, where then when there were multiple uprisings happening around the country. And the visual of the glitch uh, brought to mind the saying, uh, the system isn't broken, it was built this way. And if you notice, the user's cursor is moving, and the position of the user's cursor is actually dictating how fragmented these leather forms are and is impacting the colors that we see here. And I did this as a visual metaphor to remind ourselves of our roles as individuals. I think for any of us who have ever been in any kind of activist spaces or for anybody who, of us who like to think that we are good people, it's easy to blame society at large. It's easy to blame groups that are are outside of ourselves for the inequalities in this country like racism, um, but it is difficult to hold our own communities accountable, and it's even more difficult to hold ourselves accountable. But I think it's incredibly important to uh, really be introspective and reflect what are our roles as individuals and how are we upholding the systems that we oppose. And on a lighter note, uh, one thing I really love about P5 and just creative coding in general um, is its generative capabilities. And so 
Uh, with this design, I was able to create hundreds, but maybe perhaps if I wanted, thousands of iterations in a matter of seconds of this design. And if I was trying to design this in a program like Illustrator or Figma, this would simply just take me hundreds of hours, and I would be overthinking every single uh, design uh, so, choice such as the color or the position, uh, but with tools like P5 and creative coding, you can now generate um, an immense amount of uh, versions and iterations. And so I went and shared this design in Instagram as a sketch, and it resonated with a group of activists here in the city uh, called Projection in Protest. And they went ahead and projected this design across multiple locations. Uh, here we could see it um, projected outside of a Brooklyn precinct during a defund the NYPD march, also in the summer of 2020. Um, and then this design was also projected on the Brooklyn Bridge. And uh, this next project that I want to share with you um, in through the lens of interactivity is a new visual identity that I have just released, and it's for uh, Foveate. And so Foveate is a platform that allows you to create 3D presentations on the browser, uh, just like the ones we see here. So you can drag in 3D objects, videos, photos, audio, and then you can share these designs with collaborators or clients um, that they can view on any device from a phone uh, to a desktop or my personal favorite, which is in AR. And I worked very closely with the founders of Foveate, Ian Petrarca and Kite Kim to develop this visual identity. And they also brought on a very talented sound designer, Brian Sherman, to create the Sonic logo that you guys just heard earlier. And uh, they really needed a versatile logo for this identity that was composed of both a symbol and a word mark. And so for this identity, we started off by using a beautiful typeface called Red Hat, designed by Meckle Type, uh, which we then customized in the logo so that all the forms were in unison with the icon mark, uh, which we can see here. And so the symbol was a crucial part of this identity, uh, as well as the first element that was designed. And this was primarily because this is a tech company. So many times this identity will be viewed through mobile devices, uh, leaving very little room for this brand to exist. And so often this is the only uh, version of the logo people will be seeing. And so to create this identity, and specifically this logo that we saw, there were a few things that I took into consideration. Uh, the first, as I mentioned, this might be the only part of the mark that people will be seeing. So I knew that I wanted it to be a leather F, especially if it was going to exist in really small spaces. Secondly, the name foveate was inspired by the fovea, which is a section of the eye's retina uh, where visual acuity is the highest. So from the very beginning, I knew that I wanted to incorporate this concept of uh, coming into focus and vision as part of this visual identity. And thirdly, because this was an identity for a 3D platform, um, I knew that the identity needed to be uh, designed spatially. So it needed to be able to transition seamlessly from, a, from 2D into 3D. And after many iterations and explorations, this is what we came up, came up with. So if you notice, uh, the 2D symbol begins to simultaneously extrude as it revolves, forming this eye. And this eye now becomes a three-dimensional space and a vessel to begin to tell new stories. And so the Foveate Labs team uh, created a 3D version that we could see here, where it goes from the 2D uh, symbol into uh, the 3D eye, and then leave space to share a new narrative. Here we're seeing the Arctic scene, uh, but you can imagine how this can easily be any other type of story that's being told. Um, and you can scale up this design and scale it down and explore it uh, to your own uh, likings. And you can all scan this QR code if you like, 
Uh, unfortunately, this only works with iOS devices, but uh, for those iOS users, if you scan this QR code, uh, you will need uh, internet connection. Uh, you can then view this piece in AR, and then you can pinch to scale and really scale it up and explore uh, the design. And uh, this project was immensely rewarding because it was the first identity that I got to work on that really allowed me to take 3D into consideration from the very beginning of my design process. And it wasn't an afterthought whatsoever. And I believe that this approach will become the norm in branding design simply because we are stepping into a spatial era of design. And uh, where I believe that the multiple, multiple facets of an identity, such as color and typography and motion, now all have to be taken into consideration with dimensionality. And I think a perfect example of this is the landing page, which was designed by the Foveate team. And so this landing page features a 3D scene that the user can pan around uh, with their cursor. And inside of this 3D scene, I think the 3D renders look pretty cool, but as, all, uh, uh, as usual, my favorite part is, of course, the typography. As you pan around, you'll notice that when the type appears over a blue sky, a section of the sky that's blue, the type appears as white, and then vice versa. And uh, you could see this here in this next video. I didn't loop it because I didn't want anybody to get too dizzy, so I'll just play once. Uh, but you can see how the color is shifting as uh, the scene is, as you're panning around in the scene. And this was a feature that was coded by Ian uh, deliberately into the design. And uh, I thought that this truly encapsulated um, the future of typography in a spatial brand because typo typography can no longer remain static. And uh, in the 3D world, uh, when the user begins to shift their position, uh, how we're interacting with the typography completely changes because its background now changes. And so in order to retain functionality and legibility, uh, our type has to be kinetic. It has to react to its surroundings and has to be cognizant of uh, what is happening in, in the full uh, picture. And I believe this is a very exciting dilemma to have because uh, it opens up so many possibilities and opportunities for any designer who has been exploring with kinetic typography, um, with creative coding, or extended reality in any form. And lastly, I believe that technology can add understanding. And this last project I'll be sharing with you all is a collaboration with my friend, Lin Yun. And so we worked together to create a 3D slash AR extension for her mural for the You Are Not Alone initiative here in the city. This mural's at the Pier 17 seaport, so if you're around for a while, I highly recommend you go check it out. And her mural is painted in Hangul, which is the Korean written script. And here we could see Lin in action, painting away at the seaport. And um, on the left here, we can see um, this phrase typeset in Apple Gothic Neo, uh, which is a pretty standard treatment for uh, this script. And then on the right, we can see Lynn's rendition. And uh, immediately we can see that her version is just incredibly much more expressive and she is experimenting with the curves of the leather forms, um, which just brings a new level of warmth and intricacy to this design. And so as I began to think about how I wanted to extend this design into 3D and into a kinetic design, uh, I really took this expressiveness into consideration. And so um, we began by firstly extruding the shapes and then we began exploring potential textures and colors, really taking the Z axis into consideration. And uh, we were asking ourselves questions such as how does the visual experience change for viewers as they begin to walk around and view this piece at different angles? And secondly, we began to explore motion. And because I'm not Korean and I cannot read Hangul, at first I was very hesitant to add any motion that was too expressive uh, because I was afraid um, that if the motion was too profound, it would take away from the legibility of this forms. And this hesitation was primarily due to my cultural limitations. I consider myself to be barely bilingual with English and constantly struggling with my Spanish. And so my innate understanding of typography is limited to the Latin script. And so when I was looking at these forms, I was uh, my brain was just wired to think of these very much like the Latin leather forms. 
And uh, thankfully, Lynn was very kind and generous to share her knowledge with me. And this here is essentially just a Slack message that Lynn sent me that I just redesigned and uh, slide format. Uh, but essentially, she explained that Hangul is a modular script uh, composed of different uh, pieces, and that these components can be broken apart as long as if they're still in the same order, they still remain legible. So here we can see both the top and the bottom version here uh, spell out the exact same thing and both remain legible. Um, so with this new understanding, I was able to approach the motion in a much more expressive way. And Lynn also provided this beautiful example of Theo Jansen's wind-powered sculptures. And immediately, I just really loved how these uh, static rods were working together to create this really uh, mesmerizing, uh, flowing motion. And so you can see the impact this had in our final design here. And so for this design, we applied orange and pink to the extruded sides and alternating between the two colors. And this was a deliberate choice because as you walk around to the sides, um, as the forms begin to oscillate, you could see the shifting in colors the way we see here, almost as if they were piano keys. And then these forms are slowly uh, moving in a cyclical motion in all directions, X, Y, and Z, to create uh, the soothing uh, motion that we can see here. And then we could see this also, at how this looks like at the seaport. Um, and just one thing I really love about AR in general, I really view AR as a means to create sculptures without the limitations of the physical world. Uh, we're allowed to create sculptures that can move and we can scale them up and scale them down to these incredible sizes at no extra cost. And so uh, this piece for me was really just a reminder as well as the importance of cultural knowledge and collaboration especially because I believe that our typographic community only continues to become more and more global as time goes by. And so there are almost 300 written scripts around the world. And unfortunately, in each of our lifetimes, we simply don't have enough time to learn all of these. But thankfully, we do not have to learn all of these because we can collaborate with one another and learn from one another uh, to create new designs. And I believe it's important to create platforms for native speakers to be the ones dictating how they want their languages and scripts depicted and designed. And I believe we are at a time when we are seeing a rapid change in technological tools uh, that are, are, that are, are at our disposal as typographers and designers. Um, which justifiably creates concerns. However, I hope that by going through these projects with me, uh, you can become a little hopeful, maybe gain a little bit of inspiration, and we can all work together um, to see the potential for how these new technologies uh, can make our society a little bit more inclusive and positive and just add dimensionality to our work. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Beatrice. Um, our next speaker is Tashika Arsenal Sutton, who teaches in the MFA program in graphic design at Vermont College of Fine Arts. As the founder of Black Voice Design, she works in branding, electronic media, identity, illustration, and publication design. Tashika's research focuses on black people who are omitted from the design history canon. Her talk today looks at typography, lettering, and calligraphy, showcasing examples from publishing, music, film, activism, commercial project, products, and more from the late 1800s to the present. Please welcome Tashika. So, thank you, everyone at Typographics, uh, Sasha, Barbara, Ellen, and other folks who um, come together and work behind the scenes and in front of the scenes to put this on. I'm truly, truly thrilled and excited to be here, humbled, and um, I can't wait to talk to you about some Black designers in typography. So first, I just want to um, take a minute to talk about my research that Barbara mentioned in my bio. So. Um, my main focus is on discovering Black people who have made contributions to the design canon, but who have often been overlooked or omitted from the um, from design history books. And so, within that 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 larger scope, 
I also um, do a lot of research and focus on Black women in design. I'm interested in hip hop aesthetics. And um, about a year ago, Grindo at Letter Farm Archive asked me to give a lecture um, about my research to her history class. And so um, that's when I really started thinking about um, topography and Black design history and really started focusing on design artifacts and looking at the type um, within those um, those artifacts. And so this um, presentation is um, really taking a look at um, some traditional design artifacts and work that you all may be familiar with, also with a combination of images and things that are uh, sort of new to me and my research and I thought would be new to you all. Um, I also approached this as um, kind of like a design history lecture class, but hopefully one that you find interesting and intriguing and inspiring and make you want to do your own research, investigating your community, your identity, and your culture. All right, for my notes. So Freedom's Journal uh, was the first um, publication for African Americans. Uh, it was actually started in around 1827 when the abolition of slavery was um, abolished uh, in New York City. And when I look at pages like this, because I'm a type nerd like most of you all, but I really, really love and salivate when I look at a piece of design that's just a really nice and pristine typeset. Um, nothing really gets me off besides seeing a whole page full of text. No images. Um, you know, really clear hierarchy and um, easy to look at. This publication is the Spellman Messenger. Uh, the Spellman Messenger is the official publication by Spellman University, which is the HBCU down in Atlanta, Georgia. The Spellman Messenger was created in 1885 and it serves the alumni magazine. A Spellman is dedicated to participating in the ongoing education of its readers throughout provoking articles designed to promote lifelong learning and empowering African-American women. One of the things that um, I found really striking about the Spelman Messenger is this masthead. It's this lettering, the details, um, and this engraving is really beautiful. And um, most of the mastheads, you know, that you see in the Spelman Messenger, um, this didn't, doesn't exist in every single um, article or publication. Um, it sort of changed over time, as you can see in this one right here from 1887. The Crisis Magazine um, is one of the longest run African American magazines that exists today. It's still in circulation. It's the official magazine of the NAACP. And one of the things that I admire about the Crisis Magazine is that the design of it, there seems to be like a sense of urgency, which happens in a lot of like underground publications or ones that wasn't for like, uh, I wasn't mass produced for like a mainstream audience. Uh, it's not to say that they didn't care about the design. They really took into consideration and wanted to incorporate a lot of different um, creative voices as far as how they approach the covers, asking different uh, type of you know illustrators, even writers, the illustration for the covers. I love how the message changed over time, over and over again. It wasn't just one. And I thought a lot about this because a lot of publications, you know, the main thing was just to sort of get the information out there because a lot of content was really crucial um, to the movement. Fire. Um, I remember I first, uh, I did a lot of research at the Amistad um, Research Center, which is um, in New Orleans on the campus of Tulane, Tulane University. And um, I think I was doing, I don't remember what I was doing research for, to be honest. But I remember I came across um, this publication and I had never heard of it before. I'd never seen it before. And I was just really, really blown away um, by the cover um, design. I was blown away by the content. Um, there was a lot of controversy um, surrounded this publication because it's an apolitical African-American literary journal um, conceived in Washington, D.C. by Langston Hughes and Richard Nugent. Um, a lot of the, you know, content, you know, the, the, the artists and contributors, you know, a lot of them were core designers and a lot of that sort of content exists in, um, 
in this publication. Um, the design of the cover by Erin Douglas, you'll notice the Sphinx is drawn with slits in the eyes. It resembles African masks. Um, stepping back, the Sphinx is actually the earring or the silhouette of a black person. A person whose chain is also a silhouette of Africa itself. I mean, there's so much Larry in this really two-dimensional flat um, graphic that I, I don't know. I still look at this and I still can't believe that it was designed in uh, 1926. The Black Scholar is one of the oldest journals of black culture and political and politics. Thoughts in the United States, it was founded in 1969. Um, this cover in and of itself was one that sort of drew me in because it, the, the format and the layout was quite different than some of the other ones. Um, a lot of other ones are sort of um, more rectangular, I guess, in the composition. But this one, um, which was focused on black literature, is something about like, you know, the illustration, which sort of acts as a bus sitting on top of um, this black literature typographic pedestal with these drapes of, of topography on either sides. Um, and orange is my favorite color, so anything I see in orange really sticks out um, and grabs my attention. The Black Panther, um, which I think is a publication that's pretty familiar to, um, to lots of people, um, especially in graphic design. It's the official publication of the Black Panther Party, designed and illustrated by Emory Douglas. Uh, but the one thing that I wanted to include is because lots of times um, you see covers of the Black Panther, but we never really get a chance to see the interior. And so this summer, um, for the first time, I visited a lot of our um, archive and I was able to actually touch and, and video and actually look at. For the first time, I had never really seen any interior spreads. And because I'm a nerd of typesetting and I love to see a lot of text, um, I was just really impressed because the format of this publication is pretty large. And to see these rows of text with all these images, all the content, um, I don't know, I was just like really blown away about it. And um, I just, you know, I, I think I, I sort of expected a lot of the topography to be really sparse, but and now it makes sense because of all the information that um, the Black Panther Party was trying to relay um, to the community at the time. First World an International Journal of Black Thought was published by the First World Foundation in Atlanta. It was created by Holt W. Fuller, a prominent editor, educator, critter, author um, during the Black Arts Movement. Um, McBain, Emmett McBain uh, was actually a the designer um, of this particular publication of the cover and of, of the interior. Black um, was a publication that gave outlets for activists to talk about the injustices the community faced and advocate for fighting back against oppressive system, encouraging readers to dedicate their resources towards minimizing the daily diseases um, as much as possible. I always thought and looked at the topography and layout of this publication as being really bold. I really like um, really bold and big topography. Oh, my son is calling me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Can't believe this. <laughs> All right, back to Erin Douglas. Erin Douglas um, was a very prominent designer during uh, the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, David Walker talked about his work the other day. And um, you can kind of see the inspiration in the silhouettes, the geometric shapes. Um, African mass and cubism that obviously he was inspired by. And there is definitely this sort of, you know, uh, art deco, you know, this flatness and shapes design style that you kind of see a lot in a lot of the publications um, for the Harlem Renaissance. Charles Dawson uh, is a graphic designer who basically worked commercially a lot. Um, mainly uh, in Chicago. He did a lot of um, packaging design for hair products, which I'll talk a little bit later. But this is a book um, that he did uh, called The ABCs of Great Negroes, where he did the illustrations and, you know, basically it was a, a primer for a set of prominent um, Black people. 
And this was published back in 1933. Cities and Other Disasters. Uh, this is a book designed by Seti uh, Taylor, um, who did a lot of designs for the Broadside Press um, in Detroit in the 1960s. I'm not that familiar with Broadside uh, Press work, but I'm definitely anxious to sort of um, dive into um, their archive and learn a little bit more about the publications that they did. But this is um, one of Sadie's illustration that includes cutouts of topography. Um, you can kind of see at the bottom, in the bottom right corner. In that combination with this use of ink and the topography, um, and I don't know if this is red or orange, but you can guess that the color palette was something that drew me in again. So some of these um, I'm going to go through because of time I can't talk about as much as I love to talk about everybody and every piece in detail. I can't, but this book cover design by uh, Kirk Brown. Uh, the Black Studies National Conference was from March 18th to the 21st in 1975. It was the first Black Studies program that was held at the University of North Carolina in Charlotte. And this is um, um, a booklet that was for, um, for that conference. This publication um, is actually a book called Voices of My Sisters, African-American Women and Graphic Design. Um, it was actually uh, the thesis of a designer named Tanya Locke. Uh, it was in her for her fulfillment for her thesis um, at NC State. And I don't really remember how I came across this thesis, but I just remember um, I did a tour with the librarian. Um, I taught at NC State last year, and she was showing me, you know, where the thesis were. And I don't know if it was a conversation with Dr. Cheryl Miller, or I stumbled across it. But this thesis is really pretty amazing because Tanya Locke did interviews with some of the most like prominent black women in design, like Sylvia Harris and Gail Anderson and Cheryl Miller and Robin Lynch and Michelle Washington. And it's like nothing but interviews about their experience of being a black woman in the field of graphic design in 1994. I've checked this book out like so many times. <laughs> And I keep renewing it and renewing it. It's like the only, the only copy that's available. So you can't talk about topography without mentioning Gail Anderson. This book here, um, really, I've always been drawn to. Um, I, I'm a lover of, you know, just thinking about Beatrice lectures, uh, about um, all this technology, and I'm a lover of technology and all the things that we could do but also old technology, because when I think about history and design design history, I think about the lack of technology and the lack of resources, and especially the lack of resources by people um, from marginalized communities. So when I look at this work and it makes me want to touch it and feel it, I love a lot of press and things like that. So um, I've always been drawn to, um, to this book. Uh, for those of you who are looking for some contemporary publications, uh, Umber, um, highlights Black people, Indigenous people, Latinx, and people of color from around the world with a full palette of their experiences. This publication is designed and uh, created by uh, Mike Nichols. One thing that I appreciate about Umber when I looked at the, um, the interior design, um, they're really making some bold move with topography. Um, sometimes uh, they're following a strict grid, but you'll see really big, bold, a lot of forms kind of coming out the page. Sometimes the, the, the typesetting is really organic and movement. Reminds me of some of the layout that you see um, back in the 80s from Immigrant Magazine. And with my bay, um, this is some album covers designs uh, that he did. And one of the things that I really enjoy about his work is there's movement. You know, you feel like every album cover could be jazz or not, but there is definitely um, a lot of movement and uh, color. And, you know, the letter forms are bold, they're moving, they're shifting. You know, it's almost like they're definitely dancing. 
And so um, even if I, you know, didn't know anything about this music, if I saw these album covers during my time, um, I would definitely buy them just because of the, topo the topography. Pedro Bell um, is an amazing illustrator uh, who did a lot of work for George Clinton and uh, the, uh, the uh, Funkadelics. And um, for a while, he um, approached them and tried to get a job, right? But, um, you know, they said no. And so he just kept sort of contacting them and sending them out these illustrated letters that would have like his illustration and these little notes on it. Um, and then finally, um, they hired him, and um, he did, a, a, I mean, a whole series, a bunch of um, almost, not all of their album covers, but um, they're very whimsy. Um, you know, you kind of see this, this thing of, like, Black futurists. Um, there was always these little stories within a story. Um, definitely storytelling goes on in here. A lot of this is, you know, all this is, like, hand-done, um, illustrative. I like the fact that I don't know what it look. It looks like some kind of chaos, you know, but it definitely exemplifies the spirit of this music. If you haven't ever listened to the Funkadelics, you should. And it's very similar to, um, to, Pedro, to Pedro Bell is Lloyd Overton, who is mainly considered um, more of an illustrator, but he did do some... Um, some illustrations for um, for Parliament. And this right here, I don't know if you can see it, it says Motor Beauty Affair. And it's like two women legs like bent over. I mean, a lot of their stuff was like really, you know, kind of out there um, for the time. One of my favorites, I would say, um, album cover designers is Curtis McNair. Uh, who was a designer for uh, for Motown Records. And one of the reasons I really enjoy um, uh, his work is, you know, he did a lot of with um, dimensionality, like there's a lot of depth in 3D um, to the topography on his album covers, where there were ones that he created himself, where there were typefaces. For some of these, I really tried to look up to find where some of these come from and... I, I, I don't know um, necessarily how they were created, but this idea of masking type that we all, you know, do Command 7 in Illustrator now, right? I mean, this is being done a long time ago. Sylvia Abernathy um, was... Uh, a lot of people know her from the uh, Black Arts Movement, the mural that she did um, in Chicago, which sadly has been um, painted over. But she was one of the few Black women that penetrated the uh, music industry and designed several um, covers for, I think it was the Mark Records. And the, you know, the orange and the green you know, they sort of isolate when I'm looking at the computer screen. Um, but definitely, you know, sort of, you know, the signs of the time coming out of the 1960s going into the 70s. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 I don't know. Every time I see these flyers, I think of that song. The flyer... I guess this is your left. The pink one was designed by Buddy Esquire, who basically called himself the king of hip hop flyers. That's debatable, but that's okay. Um, but I am a, a huge fan and admirer of his work. And the flyer um, to the other side, left or right, depending on which direction, is by Phase Two, who's a very um, well known um, hip hop flyer designer. And you know, these flyers, you know, they didn't have a whole lot of time to make these. I remember reading a, an interview with Buddy Esquire, who um, was not formally trained uh, in design, but he would, like, go to the library and study and, and uh, look at topography. Um, a lot of these were done um, using letra sets, uh, just sort of done by hand with markers and pencils and ink, and it was just sort of 
photocopy and I love the rawness in these. You can actually like feel, you know, the party. Like this one says, we're definitely going to have a rock and affair. And I believe it. I mean, look at it. I mean, I mean, there's so many different, you know, lettering styles that's going on and they didn't care, you know, about, you know, oh, whatever. They didn't know a lot of this stuff was DIY and um, they were mainly about sort of just, you know, getting these flyers out there to get as many people's, you know, to come to these black parties and these, um, these sort of uh, DJ um, battles. Here you can see um, the text being cut out and sort of pasted in. Um, Gemini G, I'm not familiar with Gemini G, but this flyer over here, I don't know. I just really love all the energy and the movement that's in it. You know, you have type on the pad, you have type dancing, you have, but there is something that's still really kind of structured and harmonious about it that makes me gravitate to it. And, you know, with, with a lot of these, I think the way that, you know, they were able to sort of get away with all of this is, for one, they didn't care, right? They were young. They were just trying to get people to parties. But the other thing is that, you know, it was just photocopy flyers, you know, simple colors. Um, and it was mainly just text, you know, just topography. And a lot of these um, flyer uh, designers were also um, graffiti artists, too. Some of them graffiti artists, some of them were DJs, um, some of them were lyricists. So this is a um, offset printing uh, lithography uh, poster by Fate Ringold uh, for the United Nations of Attica. This poster for the Black Panthers party was designed by Lynn Celeste, who was only 15 years old when she created this. I make my bane again, using words to sort of talk about and uplift the spirits of a Black people. Archie Boston, who is a graphic designer, educator, I think he just recently retired from Long Beach, um, Cal State. And he was really sort of known for his brash, just kind of, you know, kind of shocking language and how he would sort of advertise and promote his design studio. And if you never read um, Fly in the, wait, Fly in the buttermilk? Yes, you should. Lloyd McNeil and Lou Stovall uh, did a lot of collaborations um, on posters. Uh, something about the sort of arrangement of, you know, um, simple shapes and colors reminds me of Sister Corita Kent. And I like sort of thinking about when things were designed in the sort of time frame and sort of thinking about who was influencing who. Um, oh, I get to talk about myself for a second. <laughs> it came out really fast. So um, back in, I think, 2015 or 2016, I was asked by the University of Missouri, St. Louis to design um, well, they didn't ask me to design anything in particular. Uh, they asked me if I was interested in having a show there. And so I say yes. And so the procrastinator in me um, waited like six months before I decided to do anything. Um, and what sort of motivated me, unfortunately, to um, do this poster series was that... Um, oh, crap. What is this? Sorry. It was the, the day before Philandro Castile was murdered. I'm sorry, I can't think of the guy. He died in Baton Rouge by police officers. Um, don't know why I'm drawing a blank. I guess I should have put it in my notes. But anyway, um, because Baton Rouge, at the time I was living in New Orleans, that's my hometown, that's where I'm from. Um, and so it really sort of hit home and was close to me. So at that moment, the exhibition was in October. This was in July. 
Um, I just sort of felt compelled to put all my anger and hurt and emotion and frustration into my design work. And up until this time, I never considered myself an activist, really. I never considered myself that type of designer. But um, I don't know. I just felt like I had to, like, put all of that stuff in my work. And so um, I wanted this um, poster series to sort of encompass, you know, topography and be topographically driven because that's something I love. But also when I thought about the exhibition space, um, because I'm a lover of words and narratives and storytelling, I wanted this poster series to sort of work in that same way. So this is how they still see us. Mammy, Brute, Mandingo, Coon, Piccanini, Sapphire, Jezebel, Sambo. This is... I felt like it was sort of the, the beginning. I wanted that poster to be first in a poster series because I felt like that's how the stories are why on, on Black people are always dying by the hands of cops. And so I felt this the problem is because this is how they still see us as these caricatures that were created by other white people doing minstrel shows. Well, white men decided that this is how African-Americans act. And so... These caricatures that weren't created by us, but sort of projected on us and how we became viewed to the world still stick with us today. And so the other thing is I'm a lover of hand and analog and I like to get dirty. And so these posters were sort of two-sided and I, you know, um, created the stencils by hand and cut them out and put them together. And the idea is that I call this series the victims posters, where it's the, the names of the victims in really large type inside the names are about who they are, you know, their story. Did they have kids? What did they work at? What did they do? Trying to humanize them. Um, and then on the outside was about like all the stereotypes and the excuses that people actually use to kill um, Omar people of color. Vocal type um, is a type foundry uh, created by Trey Seals that's inspired by um, uh, mainly activism and protest posters and signage by people of color. And so, um, I don't know, I'm just such a, a huge fan of Trey Seals and, and the work that he's done and what he's accomplished um, over time. And so, um, I definitely encourage you all to take a look at his website and actually read the information and um, because you can learn a lot about like some history there because there is some history and a lot of intensive research that is put into every typeface um, that he designed. Amos Kennedy um, is American printer, book artist, papermaker, best known for social and political commentary, politi uh, mainly in um, a letterpress uh, form. Black is Beautiful. Uh, this poster was designed by Bob Grums and the photography by uh, Kwame Braithway. Uh, this was large, 47 by 52 inches. Uh, Braithway's work which is rooted in jazz and photography, fuses the two medium into a powerful tool used to shape and promote social change. Great Ringold, another um, poster that uses a sort of like paper cutout to create the letter forms here. Uh, this is um, an announcement. Advertisement by Bill Howell for Pomola. Spencer T. Banks announcing the championship for a Negro baseball. I just keep looking at this and just wonder. <laughs> looking at how the letters, and I know we've seen things similar like this before, but it's just the perfect Afro. Like, I want to these letter forms, you know? More patterns on creating type with dimension and space. 
and use of simple color. No set of posters. Again, um, they remind me of, I don't know, I can't get Sister Corita Kent's um, posters out of my head when I see these. These are movie posters by Art Sims, who um, is mainly known a lot for uh, the work that he's done for a lot of Spike Lee movies. And so I tried to purposely find some posters that were more typographically driven and ones that you don't necessarily see, ones that aren't necessarily for like the big um, sort of blockbuster movies, but I had to include X because I mean, just the simplicity um, of this poster. I mean, that's it, that's all you need. This is uh, more work by Charles Dawson. I mentioned him earlier, who created the ABC's book. He did a lot of commercial work, uh, mainly packaging. Um, there has been question about why the images and the, the, the coloration of the people in his um, designs had, you know, fair skin, which is fair to question. And I always like seeing the process, right? The pay steps, how things were kind of put together, the, the behind the scenes. You know, sometimes we get so used to seeing all the, the finished pieces. It's nice to see things um, when they're in process. And this is some more packaging design by um, Jack Jackson. I'm sorry, Jack Johnson for Valor Beauty, which was, uh, this series was a part of um, a show in 2015 in Chicago, Culture Center exhibition of African-Americans designers in Chicago. I wish I would have seen that show. And these are some logo designs from uh, Kirk Brown for Island Records. As well as um, um, his own self logo. This is a logo sheet. Okay. This is a logo sheet for Cheryl Miller. A lot of these are hand drawn. Or from Kirk Brown, Thomas Miller. This is a uh, behind the scenes sketches for Art Sims and some of the logos that he did for um, a lot of Spike Lee movies. Louise Jefferson calligraphy. Design she did for the NAACP. This is Saxon who calls himself the last Black calligrapher out in San Francisco. And this um, presentation is using the typeface design by Darden Studios that was originally founded by uh, Joshua Darden. And these are just some resources that I use um, to do some research. You can contact me if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank Thanks so much, Tashika. Um, our next speaker is Pascal Zolkby, who lives and works in Madrid, where he runs his type foundry 29LT. His multi-script approach encompasses Arabic, Latin, and beyond. Today, he will take us behind the scenes to explore the process of creating an Arabic typeface, from historical research to finishing a complete system. Pascal earned a Master of Design in Type and Media from KABK, and he has taught design in Lebanon and the UAE. 
He has won many prizes and co-authored the, the book, um, Arabic Graffiti. Please welcome Pascal. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm so honored to be in typographics. I will try to take you into the exciting and bit scary moment a type designer feels before they uh, they start on a certain type project. So there's always this, this phase when I finish a type uh, project and I want to start a new one. I feel like I'm like I'm like frozen in time. I'm floating. I don't know what's going to be my next type project. I'm I'm scared of if I'm going to be the one that is going to be the right one or not, and uh, all of these uh, ideas. So um, so when I went to Lebanon my, in my last trip uh, in, in spring, I said, okay, um, let me try to find something there. Maybe something will spark up some ideas. And I decided to go check the archival material in uh, the American University of AUB and in the American uh, and the Catholic Press. And I was very lucky that uh, my old teacher, uh, John Cordbewe, uh, sorry, this is, uh, maybe I use this. So I was, I was lucky that I, uh, I met with my, uh, with my previous teacher, uh, John Cordbewe. He used to be the, uh, my my teacher and also used to work in the in the Catholic press between the in the 70s and 90s in in Beirut, and from the archival material he showed me, this popped up. It's one of the Berthold uh, Arabic uh, type specimens, and I was looking through it. I noticed that I know this typeface from somewhere. I have seen this scene and this meme in it. And I just remembered that in 2007, like 15 years ago, when I was teaching in NDU with John, we went and visited a press. And I remember that I went and I saw this uh, typeface within some of the lead type. And that's me uh, without the beard, maybe like 15 years ago. And I, I remember that I, I have placed my name, so this is my name in, 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 in Arabic. And back then I have bought nine uh, cases of Arabic, and they were like stored in my house, but I didn't know the value of them. They were like this full of dust, like layers of dust to them. And so I went back and I thought like, I know this typeface. So I went back home and I took out these cases and I cleaned them and it is the same typeface that I saw in this type specimen. And I was like, wow, like this is like mind blowing. Like I'm going, like there's something about this typeface. Like why 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 is it popping out? Why is it important? And then I start looking at the ha, at the scene, at the meme, and how sharp and crisp it is. So what I did is I cleaned it. I took I tried to pick the best uh, letter that I have from this set that I have uh, in my place in Lebanon. I put them on the stick, and I said, okay, I'm going to take them with me to Madrid, and I'm going to try to print them and try to make a research, maybe I can inspire to come up with a new typeface from this. So, but back then I didn't know much. So I, ah, and I also remembered that when I was teaching at AUB in Beirut, uh, we made once a research about Arabic letter set from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And I searched through it and of course it popped again and it says Nasakh Bertold. And this is the same typeface because I look at the scene and the ha and the meme, it's the same. So it seems it was an important typeface back then. And at this stage, my, my brain is running. Like, I'm not anymore like floating. I'm like running. I'm like, I'm like obsessed. Like, what's this typeface? I need to search more about it. So I go back to Madrid and I start making some research. Uh, researching online was not very uh, easy, but then I was lucky and I came to the article of Dan uh, Reynolds. Um, he is a, um, a renowned uh, type designer researcher. Uh, he did his PhD about the uh, printing press in Germany uh, uh, in the 20th century, uh, between late 1800s until 1950, something like that. And in his article, I noticed that there's one of the mattresses, and if you zoom in the mattresses, this is also the same typeface. It is called Arabic bold, so, uh, half bold number 49. And I was like, what? Like, it's, it's crazy. Like all of this information are pouring in. So I contact Dan 
And I thought, Dan like will not answer. Like he's busy. He's like, it will take him like two, three months to answer. But then he answered me like the next day. Literally, he asked me the next day, and he told me, "Look, this is very interesting, but I don't have time to write it down in an email. Why don't we meet in Zoom tomorrow?" And I tell you all about it. And I was like, "What? You're going to meet me like tomorrow and tell me all about it? Like amazing! I'm, 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 I'm so grateful for that." So I met Dan, and then he's like this open encyclopedia. He started speaking and speaking and speaking about Bertold, about what was happening in 1950s, about uh, what happened with the archive material that was taken by the Technique Museum in Berlin, and who is the person responsible for it, and what happened uh, with all the different history. So I was amazed. I was like uh, watching like a series, and I want to hit the next, like next episode, next episode button, like please, next, 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 next. <laughs> give me more, give me more information. So <laughs> and then told me, okay, you have to contact uh, Kristen, and Marcel uh, from the Technique Museum in Berlin. So I was also like, like I said, okay, I will write them. He said, don't be very like optimistic. It might take them time to answer, but just write them. Uh, we don't know what is archived and what is not archived. But um, so I contact Tristan and Marcel. The thing is that the museum cannot share any kind of uh, any kind of information publicly if it's not archived and cataloged. So, uh, and most of the stuff that they have in the museum, they are in storage, and uh, there's a part which is cataloged and it is in the museum. So Dan was a bit uh, saying that hopefully they, they archived stuff. And of course, I was lucky enough that also they answered me the next day. They were super nice people. I'm so grateful for Kristen and Marcel. And, Literally, like within two days, she sent me photos of all the mattresses of this number 49, Arabic 49. So these are all the, this is all the character set of the, of the typeface. So now I know what is the character set because in Lebanon, I, uh, I wasn't sure what are the letters, what was missing, what was present. And Marcel sent me this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, sheet. And it says there's three binders that covers the Arabic stuff from the Bertold. The number uh, 1204639, 399, 400, and 419. And he said, uh, unfortunately, these are not uh, digitized. So you need to come to Berlin to scan them. But, uh, or if you have someone to come by and scan them. So, okay, um, look, listen, um, I'm looking at this. I see that this one says number 49, and this is what I want because there's also number 50 and 32, uh, which are a bit different typefaces. But what I what I was super impressed by was number 49. And he was kind enough. He told me, "Okay, I will just scan a few pages, and if it looks interesting, then maybe ask someone to come from Berlin." So. Uh, uh, there's a missing slide here, but there's no problem. Uh, so he sent me some, he sent me some scans, and it like it showed that there's some some drawings, there's some uh, letters between Bertold and people from Egypt and from Beirut and from other uh, cities in the Arab world, uh, and there's some test prints. So I contact my 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 contacts in Berlin, and the uh, I was lucky that uh, one of my contacts, uh, Ben Wittner, who has the studio IPS 51 in Berlin, he said uh, the museum is actually five minutes around the corner from our office, and we would be happy to to help you out. So they went there, and they scanned the the binder one two four six three nine nine, and this is what was in it. So there was like these. Um, uh, like this is the first test prints that they, that they did. They were the whole character set also test printed and different point sizes and different corrections. Uh, this is again the whole character set with the basic set ligatures and supported uh, extended Arabic uh, uh, set. And these were the uh, letters. And from the letters, we noticed that there's two important people. There is a person called Salim. Uh, Al Habshi uh, from Egypt, and there's another person called uh, Michel, Michel Sergi from Beirut. But we didn't know who were these people, and I was trying to search who is the designer of this Arabic number 49. 
because it feels that it has a very special character. It's not like any other, it's, 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 it's a bit different than what was happening with Monotype or Linotype or the others. And Bertolt, you have to remember that Bertolt, they were selling their own typefaces to compete with Linotype and Monotype, but they were not selling it with the machines. If you, if, if you remember that Monotype and Linotype, they were selling a whole pack, the machine with the, with the, with the typefaces. Bertolt, they, don't, they didn't have the machine. They, so I believe that they were trying to make a more competitive design to have the client buy their funds for the design itself and not for the workability of it. So I, I thought that they should have worked with a very uh, modern designer uh, or person. And I was suspicious if it was Salim or it was uh, Sergi. But we didn't know much. So here you see that there's some drawing and then it's, it's signed down, Salim Al-Habshi. So, uh, so this is him, and it shows here in the, in the name and the, in the, in the binder. So I make some research about Salim al habshe and it turned out that he's a surrealist artist from the 40s to the 60s in Egypt, and he was doing this kind of art. And it's like, wow, amazing. Like, wh what's, what's that? Like, I was expecting like a, like a calligrapher or like a... Uh, like a technical guy working with machines or like an engineer or... So I said, okay, uh, so this is his biography. Of course, I'm not going to read all of it. But the most important part that he is, he, is, he was based, he, uh, he came from uh, Indonesia. He, he, he moved to Egypt and Netherlands. But what is important is that uh, in the 40s, he came back to Egypt and he studied, uh, he made a diplomat in calligraphy after he finished his studies in medicine. And then he went to Netherlands between the 49 and 53, which was actually just before uh, the, the sketches that we, saw, that we saw before, they were dated 55. So it was just the years before. So I spoke to Dan and he then was like, oh wow, that is a very likely hypothesis. He might have met Bertold in the Netherlands when he was there because they were, uh, Bertold was uh, um, a partner with uh, Letter Gitters, this Dutch Amsterdam type founder, and it m most likely that they met there. And then I said, okay, whom else can I, can, I, can I ask, like from these experts? And I thought that of asking Sam Bardawil and Til Philharts, they are, they are uh, expert um, uh, curators in the art uh, scene, and they did, they are, they are behind Art Reoriented, and they did a book uh, called uh, L'Art de Liberté, uh, which speaks about the Surrealist artists in Egypt between the, the uh, 38 and 48. And in it comes up the name of Salim al habshi So I contact Sam, and Sam gets back to me, and it says, again, the same response, like, most likely it is the same al habshi we are not sure because I don't have any documents to prove it, but we know that he was an avid calligrapher and he used to design the catalogs of the group that was there in Egypt, the Suez group. And the other people that I thought that I might contact is Bahia al habshi and Haysam Nawar because they wrote a book recently about the history of graphic design, of Arabic graphic design, which is, um, it, we didn't have much books before, so this is uh, like a pioneering book in itself. And I'm sort of asking them, I have the book, I checked it, I didn't see him, I didn't see him neither in the index, neither in the section of this uh, period of time. So I contact them and he told me, no, we don't have it. We don't have any information about him, but we're going to ask the American University of Cairo to check in their archive. And I'm still waiting for a response from Bahia and Haysam. Hopefully they will find something. But just before coming to 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 the conference, actually three days ago, Krista wrote me again and she told me, look, listen, we were going back through the storage material and we find this binder called 14372. It, it didn't have a number because it wasn't numbered. So it was just numbered three days ago and they gave it a name 14727372202. Arabic half bold original design. And it says on it original design. It's like, okay, so this is the designer. So now we are, we are sure her designer, and it has all of these nice drawings to it. And of course, all of these drawings, they were all signed by uh, Salim al habshi 
So now we have like more proof that the designer of uh, Arabic half bold uh, is Salim Al Habshi. We still we don't uh, we believe that he's the same Salim Al Habshi as the surrealist artist, but it's not proven 100% yet. So imagine this guy Salim Al Habshi. He's this like uh, no one no one knows about him. Like. Uh, this is like an addition to our history, like our because of course he was maybe known back then, but now not not much. But I am I'm imagining he he should have been a very like uh, forward-thinking person, like to do such a typeface in the 50s, and he's also a surrealist artist drawing such paintings. So I was like amazed by this person, and I was like uh, I was so happy to find this kind of information, and it will give much more reason for me to spend an extra one year or whatever to revive this typeface and to give it a new life in this digital medium that we live in. So, so what, do, what do I want to do with this finding that I found? So, so back in Madrid, uh, uh, I spoke to my, uh, to my new friend and colleague in, in Madrid called Juan Lopez, and he's one of the founders of Familia Plomes, they have a type, an old press, and I took the letters that I got with me from Lebanon, and we set it up, and uh, we made some prints out of it. So now I have the, the rear lead letters. They were really damaged uh, through use, but um, these are different tests on different paper, on different uh, thickness. Um, so, so all of this is now coming together for me to start my own type project. So there's the photography of the matrices, there's the lead letters, there's the print that, like the real print that we did in Madrid, the scans of the test prints that were done in the 50s by Bertold, and the letter set sheet. And what I'm doing now is I'm comparing all of these materials, uh, before I compare materials, I want to thank all of these lovely people that really helped me to get all of this information. So from Lebanon, John and Nabil, from Germany, Dan, Kristen, Marcel, Ben, Teresa, Sam, and Till, and from Egypt, Bahia and Haysam. Without their help, I wouldn't have been here speaking today about all of this information and sharing it with you. And what is the next season? Uh, it's my, now it's my turn to start the next season. So what, what, what would I do with all of this information? Like I have to give it life now. It's like, but I'm like this, this uh, idea is that, so this is not space, this is not uh, stars or any kind of uh, scientific, these are a super close up of the ha letter that uh, I started digitizing from the, so this is the upper part of the hat, lower part of the hat. So the idea is that um, I want to start a new typeface that is um, will be starting from the half bold of, of, of the design that Salim did, but it wants to be expanded into a huge super family. So it wants to expand to different weights, maybe different axes, doing it a variable font using the different technologies and all of that. So, so I started cleaning up some of the scans, uh, taking photos of what I have, uh, making the character set, uh, opening it in Glyph, putting it what I want to do, making research about the existing Nasr typefaces and how, uh, how this new Nasr uh, modern typeface would compete with what is in the market now and what would be a good addition to what exists. So an example, this is the letter seen in Arabic. Uh, these are the four different shapes this letter can have depending on its position and word. Uh, this is a blown up version of the scene medial form. And this is the outline that I'm drawing now. Uh, this is another example, the letter Hamza. Uh, also the outline above it, how it looks. This is Bertold in Arabic, Bertold, Bertold, they wrote it here. And this is how it, so I started with these letters now. So for now, I only have these letters present and all is to be done. So we remove the kashida to make it more clean. Sometimes they, put, they also wrote it bir told, not only bir told. So I want to design the typeface as if Salim is now 
creating number 49 using today's latest technology and type design. So I'm like, I want to be Salim now, like because I'm, I'm, I'm impressed by this guy, but I, I want to give all of this new technology to this typeface that I fell in love with. So this is Bertold in the letters that I drew now. I want to give an angle to the baseline, not to keep it flat, because during the 50s, the Arabic uh, script was simplified and the baseline was straightened. So I want to give it an angle to make it a bit more calligraphic. So I want to give it a two degree angle. I want to use the latest technology that is available in the Glyphs app for Arabic script, using, for example, the entry, the exit anchors, and other cursive uh, technology to make the connections. I want to use, of course, the top and bottom anchor to, uh, for the dots and the accents. And the lately added uh, uh, conditional or contextual anchors in glyphs uh, to remove uh, overlaps of dots and anchors with other letters. So for example, this is a code, this is an open type feature that uh, I would have uh, written, for example, to say that if a dot comes uh, after a letter of a ra of a wow, for it to be moved down from this anchor to, to the bottom one, for it to avoid overlapping with the letter ra or all of these I'm just showing a bit of that behind the scene of a type design word, uh, uh, just to, to 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 say that I want to take it to the to the latest technology present today, like the the best that I can use or I know to use nowadays. This is another technology that we call the elevation kerning, and um, uh, this is uh, uh, thanks to Toshi. Uh, I worked with him on a previous project called ADA, and he he made this uh, elevation kerning technology that will make kerning even if the letters are going to be escalating. So this is going to also be implemented in this typeface. This is a bit of the coding behind it. Putting this coding makes me feel a bit of like this uh, uh, scientist behind the letters, but just like <laughs> coding. So this is an example also of contextual alternates. So in, in Arabic, it's not that every letter changes form, depending if it is in the beginning, in the middle, at the end, or isolated of a word. It can also change shape depending what comes before and after it. So here, for example, we're going to use contextual alternate to change, like this is the code of a contextual alternate. So for example, here you see the letter B, Y, R. So uh, the B, the Y, and the R, and then we have the Ta and the Ha, but these letters, they will change to this shape if they come after each other. And, for, uh, and to do that, we need to do contextual alternates. So basically, uh, I'm going to use uh, glyphs and all the added uh, advanced plugins that come with this application. I'm going to use the latest uh, open type features that is present for the Arabic script, like uh, standard uh, and complex open type features, standard and contextual uh, anchor positioning, uh, standard and contextual and, and elevation kerning and other stuff. And so this is the what Salim designed in 55, or the digital version of what Salim designed. This is how I want to grow the family from only being half bold to be from light to black. So this is the weight axis in a variable font. And I want to add to it a contrast axis making it more like less contrasted. So if you want to compare it to, to a Latin, it's like taking a serif and making it a sans serif or something like that. And I want to make it into a variable font and it might still grow. So I'm still now starting the project. So hopefully in a year or two, you can check uh, 29LT website and you can see what happened with the typeface. But this would be also the variable font. For example, this is the letter wow with the axis of the weight and the contrast now, we might also add a rounded axis or a shadow axis. So this is the space of the design with the weight and the contrast. And this is how the actual idea for the type family is, but also it might grow. And uh, this is what I will be working for the coming two years maybe, or one year, and I will end with this lovely bird that we found in the, and the, and, the, and the letters, uh, just to say, hopefully there will be peace again in our world and we will be, have uh, better days ahead. Thank you so much.
Thanks, Pascal, for that typographic archaeology. I, I do look forward to that version in the surreal form. I think that would be interesting. Anyways, we're going to take a break. Um, please come back at 4.55. We have two fabulous speakers to end our conference. Thank you. I fall and you pick me up again Got your habits, got them too Just feel like maybe I could lose them with you Sinking in and I guess I kinda like that For the first time you really got my back Got your habits, got them too Just feel like maybe I could lose them with you Lose them with you, lose them with you You haven't been around for a minute, girl My phone don't make a sound, it's a distance, girl I tried to make it work, but now it hurts most times I'm trying first just to find the words to say to I know things ain't simple just like that But how you just gonna call all of this rash It's easy just for you to work away But find it crazy that it had to be this way
Hi, everybody. Um, we have another section of words from our sponsors. It gives words personality, and I think it gives the people who are using the type a way to express their personality or their moods or their ideas. We can find really inspiring new shapes to use and to share with the design community. I'm addicted to that feeling, having a great shape in front of you, and it is perfect. Being able to do that for a living is just brilliant. I'm Matthew Rex with Business Letters. I'm a business coach for creative people. For years I ran type at Adobe. Now I'm here to help make your type business more successful. Clients hire me for my business experience. They know that I truly care about them and that I truly care about type. Uh, next up is this, another spotlight, and this is a trailer for a film we'll be screening in the fall at Cooper Union. Well, I, I felt I was part of the freedom struggle of black people. I was part of the ongoing struggle of the black community to uh, establish itself, to uh, obtain self-determination, to obtain dignity, and to obtain liberation. Original Wakanda children. The idea that we could bring the greatest musicians in the world to the East and that they would perform in Bedford Stuyvesant uh, right here was something that was unique. Nation building, of course, has to be built on institutions. Then we had our food store. Kanunawana Food Cooperative. Black News Newspaper. Out of Black News, there became a, uh, a publishing company called East Publishers. Babaji Clothing Shop. East Records. We had a bookstore. The bookstore was called Akiba M. Koo. East Kitchen and Caterers. Sweet East Restaurant. Imani Child Development Center. Evening School of Knowledge. The International African Arts Festival. The East was filled with youthful exuberance. All the young people, basically very, very gung-ho. For me, I can say I was almost born in camp as a black man at the East. It was about building that self-esteem in us to be who we are as an African people and know that we have a right to be here. And so was it able to you know, bring us to the promised land? No, of course not. Did it take us a few steps toward that and our liberation? Hell yes. Our next speaker, L.A. Coral, is a Filipino-American designer who is currently VP Creative Director at Collins in New York. Storytelling is an essential part of type design, graphic design, and brand design. 
Storytelling helps clients find greater significance in their own brands. It's also a tool for explaining design decisions to stakeholders. LA will share some Collins case studies, some personal work, and a very personal story about accidentally stealing something from Matthew Carter. Hey all. Um, I feel lucky to be the opener for Sagi Haviv, the headline act who's kind of come next and close all the talk. So I know Sagi will tear the roof off of the talk. Um, I got to start by giving some uh, thanks and, and some shout outs. So shouts out Kara uh, and Sasha for inviting me. And of course, Barbara, Alan, and Mike, and all the organizers of Typographics. Thank you so much. It's been such an amazing festival, and it's so nice to, to have it back in person. For me, it's a real honor, obviously, to, to be a speaker at Typographics this year with an amazing lineup of other speakers. And, and thank you to my uh, Collins colleagues and my wife, Emma, for helping me make this talk way better than my first uh, rough draft. So thank you, everyone. So my talk today is simply called Typography and Storytelling. Storytelling is, of course, a deeply integral part of the work that we do at Collins. Um, and also in branding in general, and in many aspects of design as well, uh, including type design. So I'll walk through a couple of Collins projects and give you a little bit of a behind the scenes look, and I'll share the stories and the meaning behind the work. And then I also plan to share a little project uh, of my own from way back and the journey that uh, that, that took me through. So I'll, I'll actually start with that, and there's two parts. So part one uh, starts in Providence, Rhode Island. I studied graphic design at RISD, I took this film photo of the Waterman building. So it's film, so that's how you know I went to RISD a long time ago. Uh, for my degree project senior year, I decided to design a typeface that was based on a lot of research. And I called it this interesting name, which is Weep King, and I'll get to that later. One of the starting points for the project was provided by this man, Cyrus Highsmith, who was obviously an immensely talented uh, and accomplished designer. I took this photo. Uh, on the last day of type one, great pose. Anyway, I was lucky to have Cyrus as my, you know, sort of mentor and advisor for the project. And as I was starting my degree project, he had suggested that I look at a Jensen style Roman type to get going. And I love Jensen for its significance in where it stood in historical context of type design. And the Providence Public Library served as an amazing resource for original books and references to feed my research. I also studied Bruce Rogers and um, his original Centaur Cuts, which is probably the most famous Jensen type, and it's much more contemporary. I got into the drawing process, starting with calligraphy. Here's some notes from my professor, Hans von Dyck, and eventually got to start a set of characters. And so I finished the project, and I was really happy with it, and even received the, the degree project award for it. But you know, the, the point of me sharing this isn't to feature this typeface that I'd, I'd drawn as a student 16 years ago, it's really to talk about the providence of its name, which is Robert Weebking. And he's an incredibly prolific yet under-recognized type designer. He's an obscure name, even though his body of work is very significant and he had strong associations to some pretty important names like Frederick Gowdy, Bruce Rogers, Middleton, and so on. Even today, there's not a whole lot that you can find about Robert Weebking. And I actually love the parallels of this with Pascal's talk about Salim al habsha And, you know, doing the research on Weep King, part of the reason for why he was so under-recognized was apparently because he was just a very shy person. And he had an extreme aversion to the limelight. So anyway, I came to this realization that in the history of type design, not everyone involved always gets their due praise. And it's kind of like how, you know, a lot of details are lost in the process of drawing and printing and matrices cutting, et cetera, and translating old references into something new. So as homage to that notion, I decided to name the project uh, Weep King. Now I'm going to switch gears for a bit, and I'll come back to that. And uh, now I'll talk a little bit about Collins. We're a transformation consultancy, a branding agency, a design studio, strategy partners. We're a lot of things. We're in Brooklyn and in San Francisco. And I feel genuinely privileged to work with such an all-star cast every day. Like I mentioned before, storytelling plays such a, an important part of what we do. It allows us to make the work we do that much more meaningful, 
by creating these connections that may not have been there before. And it gives us license to stretch beyond what's expected for a certain category for our clients, as well as challenging our clients to uncharted territory. So as a tool, storytelling not only provides us that deeper significance to help our clients better understand and develop an affinity for their own brands, but it also provides a compelling means of communicating why we're making certain design decisions and that connects on a business level. Another thing that we always say that comes from our founder, Brian Collins, is design isn't what we make, it's what we make possible. And this is something that has proven invaluable time and again through countless projects over the years. And now I'll show you a couple of uh, recent examples of that. And I'll start with this gorgeous project, uh, Crane Paper, done by my incredible colleagues, Nick Ace, Jump to Rock a Weekle, Thomas Markovicius, Ian Aronson, Tom Elia, Alex Wallace, and Paul Jun. So shouts out to them as well as Camille Saab and Jacob Wise. So Crane Paper is a stationary and product paper, paper product company based in Dalton, Massachusetts, founded in 1801, almost as old as the United States, and they've been making high quality artisan level crafted papers since the beginning. And so they have a long and very deep history. And we visited their historical archives at Crane and found some truly amazing artifacts from the, American hist from the landscape of American history. So Paul Revere created the original banknotes for the American col colonies made on Crane paper. Aaron Burr made his famous challenge to duel uh, Alexander Hamilton on Crane paper, and we all know what happened there. Um, even Andy Warhol used Crane paper for his editions of Chairman Mao. The point is, Crane paper has been part of history and culture for a long time. Crane actually developed anti-counterfeiting techniques for banknotes through engraving technology. So this was a first, if you can imagine, technological innovation through paper. And Crane was right there behind it. And it was these flourishes in the anti-counterfeiting uh, style that also served as a point of inspiration for us later on as well. So fast forward to today, as Collins was working with Crane Paper, how are we going to help make a 220-year-old paper company feel contemporary for today while still holding true to their own identity? So, you know, this quote from Elizabeth Tolleman, who's a partner at Nucleus, a sister company to Mohawk, said this during the creative process. And it's this notion of slowing down for a deeper and more intimate human connection and how tangible experiences can be an integral part of that. And so our brand idea was essentially you know, about this. In a world where we don't have the time we desire for real connection or expression, Crane helps us to create that space. So how do we make people reassess the benefits of Crane in a fast-moving world? We drew inspiration from styles throughout history that were able to bring together not just incredible craft, but also narrative. And this would be you know, a counterpoint to methods of expression that valued mechanical standards and a sense of uniformity instead of human imagination, artistry, and intimacy. And so we look to Art Nouveau. Art Nouveau was a new aesthetic for the time, hence the name. It was a reaction against you know, 19th century academic styles. And there was a lot of philosophy in Art Nouveau that believe beautiful things could benefit people who saw them. And also because the end of the 19th century was a time of increasing industrialization and mass production. So artists, designers, and architects yearned a return to craftsmanship and a belief that art should be incorporated back into everyday life. Even the most mundane can become rarefied, like public transportation or banknotes. And so we took those sources and we arrived at a place that honored all of that inspiration from the Art Nouveau style, but also feels contemporary and refreshing for a paper and stationary company that just so happens to be 220 years old. And this typography in the word mark was crafted by our insanely talented Jump to Rock a Weekle and Jacob Wise, who helped refine it. Handwritten notes here as part of the case study. Again, going back to that idea from Elizabeth Tolleman of the gift of our time being one of the most valuable things that we can offer. These flourishes, of course, have that direct tie to Art Nouveau with its decorative style and sort of that romantic nature. We also made this tool that allows you to customize these elements in a number of ways through color and variations of the flourishes. And so we took that Art Nouveau style all the way back to the offices 
in Dalton, Massachusetts. And that's Grand Paper. So the next project I want to talk about is the Institute of Design. And we have another absolutely stacked team here, led by Joseph Hahn, with Sunak Kim, Jing Shi Fan, Eric Park, Tom Elia, Janet Ginsburg, Alex B, and Alex A, and our friend Brian Bugden. I think I saw in the crowd somewhere. And the beginnings of this story is rooted at the Bauhaus de Salle. Um, and despite the Bauhaus being closed in 1933 because of uh, pressure from the Nazi party in Germany, the Bauhaus ideas still continued to spread to the rest of the world, right? So Walter Gropius, founder of the Bauhaus, recommended that Laszlo Maholi Nagy uh, lead the effort to bring the school to Chicago. And so Maholi Nagy got really excited by the energy of the city and agreed to open that school um, the new Bauhaus, with, with that having the same ambition as the original Bauhaus, bringing a bunch of different disciplines together. As a person, Maholi Naj was always looking to evolve in his creative efforts, so painting, sculpture, photography, layouts, graphic design, always interested in technology and evolving it. And he came to represent the experimental and expressive side of the new Bauhaus. Another core aspect of the new Bauhaus was Jay Doblin, who joined as a director after Maholi Naj passed away. And so Doblin comes to represent the systematic and methodical part of the new Bauhaus. And he was quite different from Maholi Naj. He came with the perspective that design should solve something and it should be systematic and methodical. He created methodologies and processes. And so, again, he brought something very different from uh, Maholi Naj. So if the Bauhaus was about the integration of all the arts, and it was represented by the basic building blocks of color and shape, then the Institute of Design is all about the intersection of disciplines. And so what then could we create to represent the Institute of Design? We eventually created six basic modules as building blocks of the identity in a wider system. And they were inspired by the intersections of essential geometries that make up the world around us. Again, the intersection of all disciplines. And so here are the six modules that make up the entire identity and system. We have our straights, our diagonal, our curve, and then we start to combine those three in different ways. So if these core units represented the systematic and methodical side of the new Bauhaus, how do we represent the experimental and expressive side of the Institute? And so this is how we added some of that variability and expression into this methodical system Ultimately, it was a marriage of the two aspects of the two big influences on the institution. And of course, we then created a whole typeface out of it that was based off of this grid and those six modules. And you know, using that grid, we're able to typeset ways that have interesting alignments. And we can also stretch the letters to become sort of capitals because there was no lowercase in this typeface. And to further push the idea, we created different states of rotation each module rotating and having different um, increments, so quarter, half, three quarters, and full. And sometimes, you know, you could also keep rotating that until it becomes completely illegible. We even created this camera filter using the six modules that activates the webcam on your computer. And then in the case study shoot, you know, we had typography live as part of the ar architectural environment on site at the Institute of Design. We have this running joke that our uh, coworker Alex A here just becomes the model for all our case studies. So he's in all the photos. That's Alex. Alex. It's actually not Alex. Uh, we also created another tool with three different kinds of experimental uh, settings. So you'd have different inputs, and you could upload different photos. You could activate the video and you could modulate it in all the different ways in terms of rotation, change colors, and it really gave you this toolkit um, that gave you a lot of different ways to use that same basic set of modules and have a, a really wide range of expression from it. Just some more examples of the system coming to life in print. And then, of course, bags and uh, swag. And we even 3D printed some of these uh, core six modular units as as part of the case study to feature that connection all the way back to the Bauhaus. And that's the Institute of Design. So part two, um, earlier I shared my degree project called Weeb King, and we can go back to that and you know, pick up where we left off. Because there's another part of the story that I wanted to share 
like I said, Cyrus Highsmith was my mentor during that project. And as part of the research, he'd offered to put me in contact with none other than Matthew Carter, uh, because he said Matthew Carter had this amazing rare sample of a Jensen type that could be useful for my research. And of course, I was like, you know, the Matthew Carter, legendary type god Matthew Carter, who's got a, you know, a span of 60 years in terms of his work, pretty much completed type design and is now just doing side quests, Matthew Carter. Um, so yeah, of course, that one. And so I told Cyrus, yes, please, thank you. That would be amazing. Not really expecting anything out of it. And I honestly kind of forgot about that conversation. And sure enough, a couple of weeks later, I see I received something in the mail from Matthew Carter. I freak out and believe it. Not only did I get handwritten mail from him, but I also received this gorgeous piece of history, uh, you know, this magazine clipping from the 1930s, and it had this amazing rare Jensen type display reference. And it was such an incredible reference, complete with this Arigi script style italic, you know, basically all the stuff that I was neck deep in. Um, I didn't end up creating a display face, but you know, had I, had I taken it in that direction, I had the ultimate cliff notes for it. And I wish I had a photo of this. And I honestly can't find where it is right now, but he also wrote me this little note and said, you know, please return when you are finished. And I, uh, I, I, did, not, I did not return it. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, I graduated from RISD, I got a job in San Francisco, I moved to New York, I worked for Wolf Owens, I was in a Smithsonian campaign, don't ask, I used terrible Instagram filters, I moved to London, got a mustache, I traveled, I got older, I moved back to San Francisco, I moved back to New York, I met my future life, a lot of life happened. And the whole time I held on to this piece of mail from Matthew Carter, partly with this increasing sense of guilt that I still had not returned it, and that someday, someday, you know, I'll get around to returning it with a really nice note. And partly that it was just one of the most valued things that I owned. And maybe that, you know, I didn't actually want to return it. Um, so fast forward to 2018. I attended the condensed program here at Type Cooper. Had an incredible summer because of it. Again, shouts out Sasha, Hannes, Troy, Kara, uh, you and Clayton, of course. Getting a lot of friends and, you know, great relationships out of that. Um, and would you know it, one of our visiting professors during the program was Cyrus Highsmith. I mean, he looked more like this. And he was so nice, he was willing to recreate this photo from 14 years ago. I didn't actually ask if I could use this photo, so Cyrus, if you see this later, I'm sorry. Anyway, a year later, it's Typographics 2019. Cyrus is going to be there, and so I decided I would attend, most especially because who is going to be the speaker, or a speaker in the lineup, but... You guessed it, Matthew Carter. His talk was incredible, of course, and the thing was I knew that this was finally my chance to return this thing to him that was rightfully his. After all this time, and you know, it was leading up to this moment, it was meant to be, so I'm there in the audience where y'all are right now, and uh, I'm in awe of his talk, and of course I brought with me this piece of mail that he'd given me you know, 12 years ago or whatever, ready to finally return it. And at this point, I was, I was getting pretty nervous, you know, not only because I was getting to, you know, meet a living legend, uh, but also because, you know, maybe he'd been keeping tabs on, on, that, on that magazine clipping. Maybe all this time in the past 10, 12 years or so, he'd been thinking, God, where is that darn magazine clipping of the Jensen display type from the 1930s magazine? Sent it to that RISD kid and it's disappeared and this is why I'd never lent stuff out. So, you know, is he going to be like, it's you? Um, <laughs> I didn't know. So anyway, after his talk, I go to the book fair in the Lou Balance Center. I see he's with, he's with Cyrus, and I'm like, okay, here's my chance. I'm no joke, like, low-key sweating, pacing back and forth. Should I go in there? Should I not? Uh, rehearsing what I'm going to say. And so finally, I go in, and I finally meet Matthew Carter. I honestly don't even remember what I said. I probably blacked out, and I explained what I had and how I'd had it all this time, and how I felt awful about it, but I'm finally getting to return it. And he was like, oh, I don't even remember doing this. <laughs> and so in that moment, I felt I was released of you know, 12 years of guilt, and I was so awkward in that moment of being like, phew, you know, like, 
instead of staying and have a, having a conversation like a normal person, I just frantically took this photo of him, which was you know, this, and just like scampered away, just like dripping in sweat. Um, so I wanted to end my talk with an attempt at making sense of me sharing this really silly story about my brief interaction with Matthew Carter. And I honestly struggled um, until last night in, in finding a, a deeper significance. And maybe it's this, as a young designer, you know, receiving the help from a professor like Cyrus and receiving a piece of mail from a luminary of the design field like Matthew Carter, it really made me feel seen. And, you know, that of course has a profound effect on a young person. And maybe, you know, maybe I held on to this piece of paper for 15 years because it served as a powerful totem for me and maybe it gave me some confidence. Because even if I didn't have the words for it back then, I would look out at this field of design and see a lot of influential and important figures that ultimately, you know, did not look like me. And it can be hard to consider what's possible for yourself in your own career if you don't see a version of yourself out there. And, you know, holding on to this really old piece of paper helped me believe that maybe, maybe I had a shot out there after all. And maybe you've got a powerful totem too. And maybe there's a story to tell. Thank you. So I guess uh, Matthew Carter doesn't keep tabs on his stuff. <laughs> um, Sagi Haviv is a partner and designer at Chermayev and Geismar and Haviv. Sagi joined the firm in 2003 after graduating from the Cooper Union School of Art. His clients include Bloomberg Businessweek, PBS, Fast Company, NBC's Meet the Press, and Skillshare. Language and type are primary tools of com human communication and the focal point of trademark design. Through case studies, Sagi will demonstrate the discipline of logo design and the role of typography in the art of crafting an icon. He's written two books on identity design and teaches at SVA. Please welcome Sagi. Hi. I want to start with a big congratulations to the organizers and the speakers. It's, it's amazing to hear experts talk about type from all different angles. Um, I will talk about it from the perspective of logo design.
Wow. Thank you, Sugi. Amazing. Um, and thank you to all of our speakers today, and thank you to all of our speakers yesterday. Let's uh, give a huge round of applause for all of them. Thank you. So, of course, June is Pride Month, so we want to acknowledge that and, and, and make sure that it's remembered. So think about that, support, as, as Kyle mentioned, support um, causes that are worthy, um, find designers to support businesses. So this is like the best month to do that. Of course, Father's Day is coming tomorrow, so we wanted to make sure we acknowledge that. And of course, Juneteenth is on Monday as well. So support local businesses. Do what you can. So a really important holiday. So um, and support Ukraine, uh, which is still going through a hard a hard time. So um, it's not ending. Things are you know they're not getting better. Uh, this is the uh, the Kahovka uh, hydroelectrical plant that was destroyed, which has flooded an incredible amount of territory. So it's not just a human disaster, it's an ecological disaster. So keep, keep them in mind, even if it's not on your new stream, um, please uh, remember that it's still going on. So Slava Ukraine. Thanks. Thanks to everyone at So thanks to everyone at Cooper Union. This is an amazing institution. I'm very proud to be part of it with my wonderful colleagues. Staff. Staff, crew. Kara, oh my god. What? Waldo in the back. Waldo. You, Waldo. <laughs> All these are the ones that work. And of course, the City View crew, the, the guys in the back, who made this look amazing. So thank you so much to them. For all of us. We had incredible volunteers this year. We always do, but this is an especially a great year. So thank you for all of the volunteers, the the, the crew that was here. <laughs> And helping out, so thank you so much to them. And of course, we couldn't do this without our sponsors, so a huge, huge, huge thanks to all of them. They support us every year. There's always new ones, but it's incredible to put this together with their support, so we want to thank them and, and show you who they are, and, and once again, you've seen them, but it's a... It's a a huge, huge undertaking to get this um, up and running. So without their support, it would be very difficult to do. The, the book fair will be open tomorrow, too. So if you didn't get your fill of books now, and they're restocking. So just uh, Father's Day gifts. Uh. So thank you. We'll see you next year. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day.
Никак нет. Вы так уродливы? Скорее наоборот. Сомневаюсь. Сейчас бы не отказался. А я вот виски хочу. Шотландского? Я пью бургон. Деревенщина. Видно, обожаю кентуки. Thank <laughs> you. 